It was in May 1992, just over 30 years ago, that the Premier League was officially formed. And it was in August 1992, so a little under 30 years ago, that the first Premier League fixtures were contested. The opening weekend saw Sheffield United beat Manchester United 2-1, Norwich City won 4-2 away at Arsenal, Chelsea drew one all with Oldham Athletic, who were relegated from the Football League this season, and Leeds United won 2-1 against a team that no longer exists. John Barnes was the highest paid player in the league on £10,000 a week, Blackburn Rovers were the league's big spenders, Manchester City were skint, and hadn't spent a single penny all summer, and there wasn't a single manager in the entire division who had been born outside of the British Isles. It would be fair to say, therefore, that a fair amount has changed over the last 30 years. And to mark the 30th anniversary of what is now certainly the richest and most watched, and is arguably the best football league on the planet, depending upon what that word means to you in that context, I have been looking back at those 30 years as a whole, and at some of the greatest players and managers to have graced the division during that time. And today, I have put all of those thoughts together into one massive video, taking a look at the seven greatest players of the Premier League era in each position, the seven greatest managers, and the league's all-time greatest 11. All inclusions, and their rankings, are based upon the quality and quantity of each player's performances in the Premier League. Talent, longevity, impact, and consistency are therefore all taken into account, among other factors, and performances and accomplishments in other competitions outside of the Premier League have been disregarded. If you want to know why the Premier League was actually created in 1992, as a breakaway league which split from the Football League in a move orchestrated by the league's six supposedly biggest clubs at the time, I will leave a link to a video explaining that in the video description of this video, and I'll include a link to it that will appear on your screens at the end of this one. Without further ado though, here are the seven greatest players of the Premier League era in each position, from goalkeepers through to centre forwards, the seven greatest managers, and the league's greatest ever eleven, in my opinion and in my opinion only. Naturally, we start with goalkeepers, the footballers who, until recently, weren't really footballers at all, but now often appear to be as comfortable on the ball and in the pass as most defenders. I'll try to explain my thinking and give some honourable mentions, and naturally, you will disagree with some of my selections here and, indeed, throughout this series, and that is a good thing. It doesn't mean, and I repeat, it does not mean that you have to email me telling me to eat a bag of dicks. Got that, Rexio? All right then, let's get started. Here are the seven greatest goalkeepers of the Premier League era, as far as I'm concerned. Pepe Reina. I would say, with some certainty, that seventh place was the toughest to fill in this seven. The other six were quite firmly planted in my eyes. It was just a case of how to order them, but there are at least five keepers who I think could make quite compelling cases for deserving to feature in the overall seven. I will come to who they are with my honourable mentions, though the only one I will name now is UC Jeskalainen, who is, in my eyes, the most underrated goalkeeper of the Premier League era and undoubtedly one of the ten best. In the end, though, UC and a handful of others are just pipped to seventh place by Pepe Reina, who is another often underrated goalkeeper, I think at least. Not during his time in the Premier League so much, at Liverpool at least, where I think everyone appreciated just how good he was. But for some reason, the passage of time doesn't seem to have been particularly kind to the perception of him. In fairness, Reina typically had a pretty solid backline in front of him, and he often played in quite conservative Liverpool teams. Which might part explain why he has the highest clean sheet percentage of any goalkeeper with over 100 clean sheets in the history of the Premier League. The Spaniard kept clean sheets in 45.79% of his Premier League games, which is pretty phenomenal. And whilst that wasn't solely down to him, he was a major reason behind it. Reina joined Liverpool in 2005, immediately replacing 2005 Champions League final hero Jerzy Dudek. That was a tough act to follow, but Reina soon cemented his place in the hearts of Liverpool fans. 
He won the Premier League Golden Glove in each of his first three seasons at Anfield, and in addition to being amongst the most dependable shot stoppers in Europe, Rayner also had really quick feet and smart distribution, at least by the standards of the time. For all my love of Jaskalainen, I think Rayner perhaps just had a little bit more about him, so I went with my head and not my heart on this one. Neville Southall One of the greatest goalkeepers the British game has ever produced, Wales and Everton legend Neville Southall is arguably the best goalkeeper in this seven and he is certainly among the top four. Why is he only in six then? Well, because he actually played his best football prior to the breakaway of the Premier League but he still did enough after the greed parade began to secure a spot in sixth. One of only four goalkeepers to ever win the FWA Footballer of the Year award, alongside Bert Troutman, Pat Jennings and Gordon Banks, which isn't bad company to be in, Southall was a supreme shot stopper who wasn't particularly tall at six foot one, but looked about 10 foot tall to any centre forwards who were bearing down on his goal. Sometimes mocked for gaining weight in the latter years of his career, no one who witnessed Southall's talents would dismiss him so easily or so foolishly. A goalkeeper with meticulous attention to detail, Southall spent far more than 10,000 hours perfecting his craft, and even borrowed tips relating to reaction speed, balance and spring from other sports. The result was an almost unbeatable presence at his best, and although he only played six seasons of Premier League football, by virtue of the fact that he was already 33 years old when the division was created, it is a mark of the man that he still sneaks in. I'm also well informed that he is an absolutely lovely bloke, but that had no sway over his ranking. David Seaman Another man who played plenty of football prior to the creation of the Premier League, I think David Seaman is another goalkeeper who gets a bit of an unfair rap from football fans, and particularly from fans who are around my age and only really saw Seaman's later years up close and personal. For people my age, their earliest memory of watching Seaman live, or at least their outstanding earliest memory of him, will likely be his unfortunate lob, courtesy of Ronaldinho at the 2002 World Cup as England were narrowly beaten by a team who went on to win that World Cup with ease. Even that wasn't an enormous blunder, I don't think, but even if you do think that it was, it hardly reflected Seaman's talents more broadly. For starters, the Yorkshireman was on the verge of turning 39 at that time, so he was hardly in the prime of his career. Five years younger than Southall, Seaman began his career a decade before the Premier League was born, but Unlike the Welshman, he did play his best football in the newly formed Breakaway League. All but 19 of Seaman's 344 Premier League appearances and all but three of his 141 Premier League clean sheets came at Arsenal, where Seaman is rightly heralded as having been one of the Gunners' greatest players of all time. A big man with great big hands, though not quite that big, that was an advert for Adidas, Seaman was just brilliant at the goalkeeping fundamentals. His reflexes, handling and agility were all superb, and most of his supposed blunders were extremely isolated incidents of him getting caught out due to his advanced starting position, which I would be willing to bet prevented more goals than it led to. So old safe hands takes fifth in my seven, and his save against Sheffield United, admittedly in the FA Cup rather than the Premier League, remains the greatest save that I can ever remember watching live. David De Gea there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that this will be the most controversial inclusion in this seven, but it is one that I'm more than willing to stand by. Had David De Gea departed Manchester United at any of the numerous stages in which Real Madrid attempted to sign him when he was arguably the best goalkeeper on the planet, he would undoubtedly have gone down as one of the finest shot stoppers of the Premier League era. Why then, just because his standard has dropped since 2018, should we rewrite history and pretend that wasn't the case? You could argue, of course, that De Gea has sullied his legacy somewhat with too many subpar performances, but his best years can stand for themselves, and there have still been some gems in there, even from the last two to three years. An unorthodox goalkeeper in some respects, De Gea had, and indeed still has, a particular penchant for using his feet to deny opponents and at his best, he was absolutely brilliant at it. When he first arrived at Manchester United, De Gea looked both lanky and a little bit lost, 
and Alex Ferguson, even how to rotate him with Anders Lindegaard, at times for his own good. It would be after Ferguson retired, however, and Manchester United fell on less successful times that De Gea played his best football for the club. Between 2014 and 2017, I would maintain that De Gea reached the highest peak level of performance attained by any goalkeeper in the history of the division. It is all too easy to forget how much of a basket case Manchester United really were at times, and without some truly superhuman performances by De Gea, they could easily have spent two, three, maybe even four seasons outside of the Champions League and Europa League. So, whatever you think of him now, De Gea is, or at least was, a rare talent, an exceptional goalkeeper, and one of the finest that we have seen in the English game during my lifetime at least. Edwin van der Sar I think David De Gea at his best was certainly better than Edwin van der Sar at his best, but in terms of a safe, dependable and complete pair of hands, you couldn't wish for a much better goalkeeper than Edwin van der Sar. Perennially brilliant, van der Sar first arrived in the Premier League in 2001, when he joined Fulham after being replaced at Juventus by Gianluigi Buffon. There are probably little more than a handful of goalkeepers in my entire lifetime good enough to leapfrog Edwin van der Sar in a club's pecking order, but Gianluigi Buffon was certainly one of them. Juventus' loss was most assuredly Fulham's gain though, and following four seasons in which he looked completely out of place at a mid-table team, the Dutchman joined one looking to regain their mantle at the top of the division. A three-year title drought prior to the summer of 2005 constituted Manchester United and Alex Ferguson's longest of the Premier League era, and the wily old Scott wasn't alone in identifying goalkeeper as a problem position where Roy Carroll and Tim Howard had been battling it out for a starting berth. Van der Sar came in and immediately brought a sense of calmness to the Manchester United backline. Both as tall and thin as he was brilliant, Van der Sar had excellent positioning, he commanded his six-yard box brilliantly, and he was a trailblazer during the 1990s and early 2000s in terms of his skill and distribution with the ball at his feet. A first-class professional, van der Sar made 313 Premier League appearances, and I doubt he had more than 10 that were below a 7 out of 10 in terms of his performance. His record of 90 clean sheets in 186 Premier League appearances for Manchester United is outrageous, and his spot in third in this seven was pretty much set in stone. Petr Cech it's almost six years to the day since Petr Cech broke the Premier League's clean sheet record, and the Chelsea legend went on to win another 32 Premier League clean sheets after that, making him the division's undisputed clean sheet king. I think an outstanding case could be made in favour of Petr Cech having been the greatest goalkeeper of the Premier League era, and I suspect that had his skull not been fractured in that collision with Stephen Hunt, ruling him out for an extended period of time and resulting in him wearing a scrum cap for the rest of his career, he would, almost certainly, be considered the league's greatest goalkeeper by something like 90 plus percent of supporters. Only Chelsea's second signing of the Jose Mourinho era, Czech rapidly became one of the Chelsea boss's star men, and he remains one of the division's all-time greatest pieces of transfer business. Signed for just £7.1 million from Wren, it should be said that Chelsea already had a very good goalkeeper at the time, in the form of Carlo Cudicini, meaning the only form of the highest calibre would see Czech cement a starting berth. His form went above and beyond even the most optimistic of Chelsea fans' expectations, though, and in his debut campaign, Czech conceded just 15 league goals, the fewest any Premier League team has ever conceded in a single campaign. A brilliant character, leader, and above all else goalkeeper, Czech really was the complete package. Gianluigi Buffon called Czech the greatest goalkeeper of his era, which is high praise indeed. And whilst I would probably put him in a bracket, only narrowly behind the likes of Buffon, Casillas and Neuer, he absolutely deserves to be mentioned alongside those greats. And he's excellent value to be our runner-up in this seven at the bare minimum. Peter Schmeichel. Predictable, tedious, correct, it is all of the above, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to crowning Peter Schmeichel as the greatest goalkeeper of the Premier League era. Petr Cech kept more clean sheets, and Edwin van der Sar was better with the ball at his feet. 
but all round, in terms of what they brought to a team, Peter Schmeichel topped the lot of them. Capable of winning almost 10 points a season through his own individual brilliance, it was at Euro 1992 that a lot of people really sat up and took note across Europe of just what a sensational goalkeeper Peter Schmeichel really was. By that stage, which was also the year in which the Premier League was created, it was already too late for anyone to snap Schmeichel up, since he had already signed for Manchester United for an absolute bargain £505,000 from Bromby in 1991. Schmeichel only actually spent eight seasons at Manchester United, and therefore only seven in the Premier League. And I say only, solely in comparison to Petr Cech's 11 seasons at Chelsea, and David Seaman's 13 years at Arsenal. Nonetheless, the role that he played in cementing Alex Ferguson's side as the dominant force within the English game was as great as the contribution of any goalkeeper to a single club in the history of football in this country. Schmeichel was, on his day, almost unbeatable. He is the only Premier League goalkeeper who multiple world-class centre-forwards routinely admit to having dreaded playing against, due to his size, reflexes, and general aura. For my money, which, admittedly, isn't that much, he is the best there has been in the Premier League. So that is it for my seven, but honourable mentions, above all else, go to my boy Yusi Askelainen, of course, along with Shea Given, Tim Howard, Hugo Lloris, Jens Lehmann, David James, Mark Schwarzer, and Nigel Martin. Perhaps the trickiest keeper to leave out was actually Joe Hart, who is tied with Petr Cech for the record of having won the most Premier League Golden Gloves though I don't believe his peak was anywhere near to Czechs or De Gea's, and his drop-off came much earlier and was much more dramatic than De Gea's. Nonetheless, I think you could make a case for including him ahead of Pepe Reina in 7th, I just wasn't quite convinced. Current Premier League shot stoppers Alisson and Edison are also deserving of honourable mentions, and could easily both crack my 7 in years to come if they maintain their standards or reach yet greater ones. Ultimately, the fact that Edison has only played four full seasons of Premier League football and Allison only three, along with the fact that I don't think the standard that they have set has been that vastly superior to a Pepe Reina, for example, prevented them from featuring, but they certainly came close. Seventh, Cesar Azpilicueta. As ever, Choosing who to leave out of this seven entirely was a much tougher task than ordering the seven that I have included. It is a mark of Cesar Azpilicueta's consistency and his longevity in particular, therefore, that he is the right back who I opted to include in seventh. It should be said, given Cesar Azpilicueta's versatility, that I'm only considering players for this series in one position, and only in what has, statistically, been their primary position. James Milner and Jamie Carragher, for example, have both played plenty of games at right-back in the Premier League, but unlike Cesar Azpilicueta, it is not where they have played the bulk of their football. Chelsea have spent more than a billion pounds on players since Roman Abramovich acquired the club in 2003, smashing transfer records to sign the likes of Andrei Shevchenko and Fernando Torres. And yet, they have completed few better deals during that time than the £7 million acquisition of Cesar Azpilicueta from Marseille in the summer of 2012. Brought in immediately after Chelsea won the Champions League during the same summer as Eden Hazard and Oscar arrived, Azpilicueta arrived to little fanfare. Azpilicueta has since played 449 games for Chelsea, 309 of them in the Premier League. He has won the club's Player of the Year award, the Premier League title twice, and the Champions League as Chelsea's captain. Positionally brilliant and incredibly well-disciplined, Azpilicueta is among the most solid and consistent defenders to have played in the Premier League, whether that be a right-back, left-back, or as part of a back three. But ultimately, it is right-back where he has played most of his football, and as such, he gets us started in this seven. Sixth, Lee Dixon. As with a number of players who were active during the start of the Premier League era and who will feature in this series, it is a bit trickier to rank Lee Dixon than the others in this seven. Dixon played his best football probably in the last three to four years of the first division, winning two top flight league titles as a stalwart in an excellent Arsenal backline and making the PFA team of the year in three of those four seasons. 
Nonetheless, despite being 28 years old when the Premier League began, the Gunners legend still played over 300 games in the newly rebranded Breakaway League. Dixon, along with the likes of Tony Adams and his opposite fullback Nigel Winterburn, most likely have Arsene Wenger to thank for that fact, with the lifestyle changes that he implemented at Arsenal, in terms of their diet, discipline and psychology, widely felt to have played a role in their longevity. I spoke in the introduction about how the right-back role has changed, but Lee Dixon was very much a marauding fullback by the standards of the time. A tireless runner up and down the right flank, Dixon was quick thinking, dogged in carrying out his defensive duties, and he could cross a ball. That Arsenal back line was certainly greater as a whole than the sum of its parts, as Dixon would be the first to admit. But that is not doing down his ability as a fullback, rather, it is even higher praise of their collective brilliance. Were Dixon 18 when the Premier League began, rather than 28, he'd likely trouble our top three. But in the real world, having made his Premier League debut before some of the players in this seven were even born, he takes sixth. Fifth. Rob Jones. The least obvious, and therefore perhaps the most controversial inclusion in this seven, Rob Jones is rarely talked about in conversations surrounding the best right-backs to have played in the Premier League, unless you ask anyone who played alongside him. Liverpool have always had a history of great right-backs, one that they are continuing to this day, and when Rob Jones joined Liverpool in 1991 from Crew Alexandra, he was tasked with replacing an Anfield legend in the form of Steve Nicholl who had himself replaced one of English football's all-time great right-backs, namely Phil Neal. It was a tough task, particularly for a 19-year-old whose only previous experience was of playing in the old 4th division. But Rob Jones was a natural. On his debut for Liverpool, he kept Manchester United's rising young star at Ryan Giggs quiet in a 0-0 draw. He quickly endeared himself to the Anfield faithful through his committed performances, fantastic defensive nous, and his confidence on the ball. Steve McManaman called Jones the best defender he ever played alongside, naming him in his all-time teammate 11, alongside the likes of Roberto Carlos and Zinedine Zidane. So why is Jones so often overlooked? Well, that's because his career was cut so drastically short. Jones suffered from a recurring back injury and a particularly persistent knee injury which still couldn't be fixed despite three operations, from the age of 24 onwards. He officially retired at the age of 27, though by that point he hadn't played a single Premier League fixture in over two years. Jones played only 155 Premier League games in total, which restricts him to a spot in fifth, but it is anyone's guess where he would have ranked were it not for those crippling injury setbacks. And it would have been interesting to have seen who made the right-back position their own for England between him and Gary Neville. Jamie Carragher has always said that it would have been Jones, having played alongside both. But then again, he would say that, wouldn't he? Fourth, Pablo Zabaleta. From a right-back whose career was sadly curtailed by injuries very early on, to one who seemingly never suffered a long-term injury setback, Pablo Zabaleta was a superb fullback. In Manchester City's first summer under Sheikh Mansour's ownership, they signed Robinho for a British record transfer fee, as well as securing the return of club legend Sean Wright Phillips from Stamford Bridge. However, it was a 23-year-old right-back from Argentina who was signed for less than £6.5 million from Espanyol, who would end up being the Citizens' outstanding piece of business that summer. Pablo Zabaleta went on to spend nine years at Manchester City, narrowly missing out on a testimonial, though he would play a further three seasons of Premier League football at West Ham United. There have been better attacking and defensive fullbacks to have played in the Premier League, but all round, in terms of their attitude, application, and turning in consistently excellent performances, few can lay a glove on the Argentine. Zabaleta played over 300 games of Premier League football in total, and though he only made the PFA team of the season once, in the 2013-14 campaign, I suspect most impartial observers would pick him at right back in a Premier League team of the decade between the years of 2010 and 2020. All things considered, given the quality and consistency of his play in the league, Zabaleta is unfortunate to miss out on our top three. Ultimately, I think just missing out, to three superior footballers. Third, Trent Alexander-Arnold. 
I said earlier that Liverpool are currently continuing in their tradition of having excellent right-backs, though that is just about the only thing that can be described as being traditional about Trent Alexander-Arnold. I have seen efforts made to downplay the significance of the Liverpool man, but I don't think that there is any real precedent in football for what he has done over the last four or five years. Obviously, whether it be Cafu or Marcelo, Alexander-Arnold is not the first extremely attack-minded fullback. But for an elite-level football team, and let's be clear here, that is exactly what Liverpool are, to be as dependent on their right-back as Liverpool are on Alexander-Arnold in terms of providing them with creativity, I think that is quite unusual. It's funny in some respects because Alexander-Arnold was my primary example of the futility oftentimes when comparing players based on their positional designations since he does not carry out what we would consider to be most of the primary functions of a fullback, even in the modern era. I think Alexander-Arnold is probably Liverpool's second most important player now, and if not, then he is at the very least third, which again, is not normal for a fullback in such a brilliant team. The only thing holding him back in this seven is his age. Trent is still only 23, though he has already made 147 Premier League appearances and he has already recorded 42 Premier League assists. By the time he retires, and quite possibly a good few years before that, I suspect Alexander-Arnold will be a nailed on inclusion in most Premier League era 11s. For now though, he has to settle for a spot in third as right backs go, but even that is pretty remarkable for a 23 year old. Second, Carl Walker. I must admit, I've always been quite hard on Carl Walker because I found him to be so frustrating, particularly for England. Despite being among the most experienced defenders in the game, having started out so young, Walker was always prone to the odd rash decision and moment of madness. Hence why, I think, Pep Guardiola didn't trust him in some of the bigger fixtures earlier on during his reign. My personal view is that the carelessness and rashness within his game always came as a consequence of Walker's blistering pace, which he felt afforded him such a luxury to not always take up the exact right positions or to be fully alert. Of course, that is fine 99% of the time, particularly against lesser teams and lesser players and Walker's recovery pace is probably the most remarkable that I've seen from a defender in my lifetime. But against the really top players, when it mattered most, he could be caught out. I no longer feel as though that is the case. And at both the Euros, or when Manchester City faced PSG early this season, when I have had the pleasure of watching him up close and personal, I never felt that Walker was on the verge of making a big mistake. Indeed, up against Kylian Mbappe, the Frenchman looked genuinely frightened to try and take him on. It will be interesting to see how Walker matures now, age 31, once that pace just slowly starts to desert him. And perhaps that is why we are seeing more measured and seasoned performances from him now. Either way, even if he never played another game of Premier League football, with 328 Premier League appearances to his name right now, and having made the PFA team of the year three times, only restricted from making, a couple more appearances by the man who preceded him in this seven, Walker, is undeniably fantastic value for a spot in second. First, Gary Neville. It's boring, it's predictable, but like my top spot in our opening seven looking at the Premier League's greatest goalkeepers, it is also correct. Gary Neville is not the most gifted fullback to have played in the Premier League, and that is one of the reasons why I think Trent Alexander-Arnold and others may well go on to exceed him but he is still the greatest for the time being. Physically, Neville wasn't much to write home about. He wasn't the quickest, tallest, or strongest player at any age group. Technically also, there was little to split him and at least 10 others in Manchester United's so-called class of 92, many of whom you have never heard of. Mentally, however, Neville was superb, both in terms of his effort, application, and devotion to the sport, but also in his understanding of the game, defensive positioning, and sixth sense for danger. He may have committed the odd blunder in his exactly 400 Premier League appearances, but ask almost anyone who played against him on a frequent basis, and they'll tell you Neville was a nightmare to come up against. Relentless in his defensive work, he didn't give forwards or wide players an inch, and had he been just a bit taller, he could easily have been a top-class centre-back. Though Neville wasn't the quickest, he certainly got up and down the right flank forming a famous partnership with David Beckham for a number of years. 
Among Neville's finest attributes was the very fact that he knew his limitations, and was therefore highly accomplished in playing to his strengths. In the modern game, I suspect Neville would have to transition to centre-back since the top teams want something out of their fullbacks that he couldn't give them. But for 19 years at Manchester United, he was as solid as they come at right back. He made the PFA Team of the Year five times, and he deservedly made both the Premier League Team of the Decade and the overall Premier League Greatest Eleven that was compiled for the Premier League's 20th anniversary. Ten years on, now in the 30th year since the Premier League's breakaway, Neville still comes out on top in terms of Premier League right backs, as far as I'm concerned. Thankfully, he doesn't quite come out on top in terms of YouTube channels just yet, currently on 345,000 subscribers, which is a solid 100,000 behind yours truly. Though, he has only uploaded 37 videos. Still, at least I'm not sponsored by a betting firm, so you do right to subscribe to me instead. Admittedly, you can subscribe to both. And according to my YouTube analytics, quite a lot of you do. I don't blame you because, you know, despite the gambling ads, the overlap is quite good. That may be it for my seven, but honourable mentions go to the likes of Branislav Ivanovic, Bakary Sanya, Seamus Coleman, Glenn Johnson, Steve Finnan, Stephen Carr, Gary Kelly, Laurent, Dan Petrescu, and Joao Cancelo. I think Ivanovic and Petrescu are particularly unfortunate to miss out. Meanwhile, this seven came just a little bit too soon for Cancelo, who has only played 65 games of Premier League football to date. 7th, Virgil van Dijk. I gave you that little spiel about the quality and quantity of a player's performances in the Premier League in the introduction, and that is especially relevant when discussing Virgil van Dijk. The Liverpool man has only played 181 games in the Premier League, which is fewer than the likes of Michael Keane and Harry Maguire, and also happens to be the fewest of any inclusion in this seven. That is simultaneously a justification for why Van Dijk only comes in seventh, for the time being at least, whilst also speaking to how good he has been during those 181 games in order to make this seven at all. Not only has Van Dijk only made 181 Premier League appearances, only 114 of those appearances have come at Liverpool, where he has competed at the top end of the division. Age 30, one suspects, and indeed one would hope, that Van Dijk still has plenty of football left in him, and I see no reason why he couldn't theoretically end up ranking as one of the, say, three greatest centre-backs of the Premier League era. Certainly, in his first two and a half years at Liverpool, Van Dijk was as good as any centre-back that we have seen in the top flight of English football during my lifetime. A giant of a man who rarely needed to get out of second gear, Van Dijk has very few weaknesses when he is at the top of his game. Given how complete he is, physically, mentally, and technically, juxtaposed with his lack of game time compared to others in this seven, I think he had to feature, but I couldn't justify putting him any higher than seventh. Sixth, Vincent Company. I suspect most people would agree that at his best, Virgil van Dijk is a superior centre-back to Vincent Kompany, and I would agree. In fact, even Vincent Kompany would agree. In May 2020, Kompany stated that he thought van Dijk was the greatest Premier League centre-back of all time. However, Kompany has played a lot more Premier League games than van Dijk, 84 more games at this point to be specific, and he spent almost all of that time competing at the top end of the division. Company arrived at Manchester City in the summer of 2008 before Sheikh Mansour, but he would be one of the few to survive the overhaul that was carried out under the Sitton's Emirati Royal over the next few years. Company joined Man City as a defensive or even central midfielder, but he soon transitioned to centre-back, becoming the club's talismanic and inspirational leader for the next decade. I don't think that there is a single attribute that Company would rank as being the best at in this seven but he was just rock solid all round. Quick, strong, intelligent, dominant in the air, vocal and an excellent role model, Company rarely let Manchester City down when it mattered most, and he even popped up at the other end of the pitch to score some crucial goals, most notably one against Manchester United and what was effectively a title deciding wonder goal against Leicester City. Injuries prevented Company from completing a full season at the Etihad during the second half of his decade at the club. But even then, he still managed to make a telling contribution, often at key moments, so he takes sixth. Fifth, Nemanja Vidic. 
Sir Alex Ferguson had a reputation for getting his transfer business done early during the summer window, and of typically overlooking the January window entirely when teams tended to be more desperate and fees were often inflated. He broke with that tradition in January 2006, and for very good reason, as Manchester United signed Nemanja Vidic and Patrice Evra just five days apart. Both would go on to become club legends, but it is Vidic who is the focus of this seven. Vidic was, in many respects, the perfect partner to Rio Ferdinand. Brought in from Spartak Moscow as a 24-year-old, across his first five full seasons in the Premier League, I would say Vidic was the outstanding centre-back in the Premier League. A throwback in many respects, Vidic was tough, brave, and very aggressive. Always first to the ball, invariably he would win it, and on the rare occasions in which he didn't, Ferdinand would be on hand to sweep up. Vidic was the first defender to be named as the Premier League player of the season, and he remains the only defender to have won that award twice. The only other two-time winners are Thierry Henry and Cristiano Ronaldo in any position, which, you know, isn't bad company for a no-nonsense Serbian centre-back to be in alongside. Vidic made the PFA Team of the Year four times, which is the joint second most appearances of any centre-back during the Premier League era, and in 2012, he was voted by the public into a 20th anniversary Premier League era best 11. Vidic's last few seasons at Old Trafford were disrupted by injuries, and he wasn't quite the physical force of his earlier years. But with 211 Premier League appearances under his belt, at least 150 of them of the very highest calibre, he takes fifth for me. Fourth, Tony Adams. Purely defensively, in terms of the fundamentals of defensive positioning, organisation, man-marking, aerial ability, blocking shots, and dispossessing opponents, I would say Tony Adams is the toughest centre-back to come up against, and therefore, surely the greatest in that respect, that we have seen in the Premier League. For that reason, when I did my first draft for this seven, creating a 33-man shortlist before whittling them down to just seven, I penciled Tony Adams in at second place. And that is where he would have remained had he spent, like every other player in this seven, his entire career playing during the Premier League era. Unfortunately, Tony Adams began his professional career in 1983, and he was soon to turn 26 at the time of the Premier League's breakaway from the First Division. He still went on to play 255 games in the newly formed league, keeping a remarkable 115 clean sheets during that time as the key cog in an outstanding defensive unit at Arsenal. Adams became Arsenal's club captain in 1988 at the age of only 21, and he would captain them for the next 14 years. His four championships, two of which came during the Premier League era, give him the unique distinction of being the only player to captain a team to winning top flight league titles in three different decades. Adams wasn't the quickest or most gifted of centre-backs, though he did become more confident on the ball under Arsene Wenger. But when it came to blocking shots, timing his tackles, and generally just keeping the ball out of his own net, arguably the Premier League has not seen anyone better. Third, Sol Campbell. Sol Campbell is among the finest centre-backs from the Premier League and indeed beyond during my lifetime, and I am always a little bit bemused when he isn't recognised as such. Alright, maybe I can understand why Spurs fans wouldn't want to recognise him as such, but no one else. The complete centre-back, Campbell was tough, intelligent, and a fantastic athlete. He broke through young at Tottenham, initially filling in at both right-back and left-back, but he soon settled at centre-back, which was always his strongest position. The season in which Campbell made his debut was also the Premier League's debut campaign, and before long, he was one of the outstanding defenders in the division, and they nailed on starter for England. A three-time PFA Team of the Year inclusion, Campbell was also the only player from a star-studded England team to make the team of the tournament at the 2002 World Cup. Four years later, he became the first player ever to represent England at six consecutive international tournaments. Campbell made a grand total of 503 Premier League appearances, the third most of any centre-back, just five games off top spot, and the 13th most of any player in any position ahead of the likes of Wayne Rooney and Paul Scholes. Of course, Campbell very famously, or infamously, depending upon your club allegiances, ran down his contract at Tottenham before joining the club's North London rivals on a free transfer. 
The move earned Campbell the nickname Judas among Spurs fans, though it also saw him win two Premier League titles and three FA Cups. Whatever your views on him as a person though, Campbell was a sensational centre-half, and his spot in third was pretty ironclad based upon my criteria. Second, John Terry. If I were to hazard a guess, I think the common perception among most football fans in England is that John Terry is the greatest centre-back of the Premier League era. And I must admit, it is an opinion that I can completely understand. And indeed, it is one that I used to hold. With age, most centre-backs gain a greater understanding of the game and positional sense, which can compensate for the fact that their speed is starting to deserve them. In the case of John Terry, however, he just seems to have been born with first-class positional instincts and a remarkable defensive nous. Positionally, I think he is the best centre-back that we have seen in the Premier League, and that wasn't all that he had going for him. A fantastic leader and a talismanic captain at Chelsea, Terry was a commanding presence, incredibly brave and committed. Not a giant at six foot two inches tall, Terry possessed a fantastic, determined leap, attacking the ball with real purpose, which made him a titan in both boxes and saw him score a career total of 74 goals. Deceptively quick, at least up until his early to mid 30s, Terry was typically partnered with a more technically gifted centre back at both club and international level. But whilst he was not a bona fide ball playing centre back, his distribution was almost always safe and accurate, even if it wasn't as incisive or as adventurous as his comrade at centre back. Terry played 492 games of Premier League football, all of them coming at Chelsea, and he won more Premier League titles as a club captain than any other player. A four time PFA Team of the Year inclusion and five time FIFA Pro World 11 inclusion, Terry was a formidable centre back. And I think most people would agree that he would have to make a best 11 of the Premier League era or at the very least make the bench. First, Rio Ferdinand. As I said just a moment ago, I think if you polled followers of the Premier League on who is the greatest centre back in the history of the division, most would go with John Terry. However, if you were to put that same question to players and managers, at least those who played and managed during Ferdinand's time in the Premier League, I suspect a majority would go with him. Ultimately, I think Ferdinand is the greatest Premier League and English defender of my lifetime, and I think he would come very close to making an all-time England eleven. A born footballer who simply had it all, Ferdinand might have become a centre-forward or a number 10 were it not for his size and presence on a football pitch. Gifted and incredibly composed in possession of the ball, Ferdinand was unlike anything the English game produced in at least 30 years. I have a soft spot for ball playing centre halves, which always gave Ferdinand the edge in terms of this seven, but I do think that he just had that bit extra above every other defender that we have seen in the Premier League. Starting purely with the numbers, Ferdinand played 504 Premier League games the second most of any centre-back in the history of the division, trailing Jamie Carragher by just four appearances. During that time, he broke the British record transfer fee twice before he had even turned 24, he made the PFA Team of the Year six times, which is a record among centre-backs, and puts him level in terms of inclusions in that side with Thierry Henry, and were it not for an eight-month ban that he received right at his peak, his position in top spot might be even more unassailable within this set. My only regret when it comes to Rio Ferdinand, as I've mentioned previously on this channel, is that Glenn Hoddle didn't get longer to work with him at international level. Hoddle loved technically gifted footballers and had ambitions of turning Ferdinand into a continental, almost Franz Beckenbauer style sweeper, where I strongly suspect he would have flourished. In the end, he became a more traditional centre-back, just one that was very good on the ball. But in spite of the what-ifs, he still managed to become to my mind, the greatest centre-back that we have seen in the Premier League. So that is it for my top seven, but I implored you to stay tuned for my most honourable of mentions, and thank you sincerely for doing so. Chelsea trio Marcel Desai, Ricardo Carvalho, and Gary Cahill all came close to featuring, and Desai and Carvalho in particular, had they spent just a bit longer in the Premier League, likely would have made the cut. Steve Bruce and Gary Pallister fall victim only to having played a lot of their football prior to the creation of the Premier League, though I still think Pallister can consider himself unfortunate to have missed out. 
Similarly, Paul McGrath was as good as anyone in this seven at his best, but only managed five seasons in the Premier League and probably played his very best football in the final years of the First Division. Yap Stam's inclusion was explained in the introduction, and both Ruben Diaz and Americ Laporte missed out for similar reasons. Elsewhere, the likes of Jamie Carragher, Sylvan Distan, Colo Torre, Ledley King, Phil Jagielka, Jonathan Woodgate, William Gallas, Sammy Hippier, Jan Vertonghen, Toby Alderweireld, Mark Wright, Colin Hendry and Gareth Southgate just go to emphasise the quality of centre-back that we have been fortunate enough to witness in English football over the past three decades. Woodgate and King, it must be said, without injuries, could have been as good as just about anyone and would have made for some really interesting selection dilemmas for various England managers, in addition to me, with regards to this seven, of course. Sadly, Ledley King had a glass knee and Jonathan Woodgate was built out of honeycomb, but they still managed to make my shortlist and for very good reason. Seventh, Andy Robertson. I was always in a bit of a lose-lose situation when it came to Andy Robertson. There will be those who don't feel he has done enough yet to feature ahead of some of the players who only earn honourable mentions, whilst others, particularly some Liverpool fans I suspect, might argue that he is already one of the best offensive left-backs that we have seen in the Premier League. In the end, instead of trying to appease anyone, I just put Robertson where I actually think he deserves to rank, which is sort of the purpose of this series. We'll start with the negatives. Robertson has so far only made 205 appearances in the Premier League, which is the fewest of anyone in this seven and by some margin. What's more, more than 50 of those appearances came during his time at Hull City where he was relegated in each of his two Premier League campaigns. As a Hull City fan who watched almost every one of Robertson's games in a black and amber shirt, I can say that he was nowhere near the player that he has become at Anfield during his time in East Yorkshire. He already had a tremendous ability to whip dangerous balls into the box, particularly those ones with pace that curl right around the last defender, but he was still incredibly raw and a bit defensively naive. As I have often said on this channel, it is a testament to Jurgen Klopp's management skills, Liverpool's coaching team, and most of all, to Robertson's own willingness to learn and improve, that he has become one of the best fullbacks in the world at Anfield. I don't believe there is another team in world football where Robertson would look as brilliant or be as effective as he is at Liverpool. But that is a rather redundant point in many respects since the vast majority of his Premier League appearances have indeed come in this Liverpool team. By the time he hangs up his boots, given the fact that he is still only 27, I think Robertson should rank among the three greatest left-backs of the Premier League era. For now though, based upon my criteria, he has to settle for an extremely creditable spot in 7th place. 6th, Nigel Winterburn. Going straight from the youngest player in this 7 to the oldest, Nigel Winterburn had already won two top flight league titles, an FA Cup, and played the last of his games for England before Andy Robertson was even born. The Arsenal backline of Dixon, Bold, Adams and Winterburn is among the finest defensive quartets that we have witnessed in the English game, let alone solely during the Premier League era and three out of the four have now featured in this series, with Bold having received a richly deserved honourable mention. As I said earlier in this series, the whole was certainly greater than the sum of its parts when it came to that Arsenal defensive unit, but that is only because the whole was so outstanding. Nigel Winterburn was an exceptional left-back in his own right, racking up an incredible 352 Premier League appearances, despite the fact that he made his league debut almost a decade before the Premier League was founded. Arsenal have long had outstanding left-backs, and Winterburn maintained that tradition. Incredibly professional, committed, and consistent, Winterburn had a terrific engine, he was first in the tackle, and his defensive positioning was outstanding. He almost never let Arsenal down across his 584 games for the Gunners, and even after he left the club, age 36, to join West Ham, he still went on to enjoy three rock-solid seasons of Premier League football. For his sheer longevity and consistency, there is simply no way in which I could leave him out. Fifth, Graham Lasso. Graham Lasso already had 100 first-team appearances under his belt before the Premier League broke away from the Football League in 1992, but he still went on to amass 327 Premier League appearances over the next 13 seasons. 
Born on the island of Jersey, Lasso was brought to Chelsea at the age of 19, and it was at Stamford Bridge that he played his first half season of Premier League football. It might be hard for some people to believe these days, but at the time, Chelsea were a mid-table team facing financial difficulties. Meanwhile, Blackburn Rovers were the Premier League's biggest spenders. And in March 1993, Lasso joined Rovers from Chelsea for a fee of £700,000. During his time at Blackburn, Lasso won a Premier League title, he made the PFA Team of the Year, and he established himself as England's starting left-back, taking the place of another Premier League legend in the form of Stuart Pearce. That was a mark of Lasso's class, and in 1997, he returned to Chelsea, where he made the PFA Team of the Year for a second time. Lasso was a very versatile footballer who was, in many respects, a fullback who had been born a decade or so too soon. Quick, elegant on the ball, and in possession of a brilliant delivery into the box, Lasso was the Andy Robertson of his day in terms of his creative output. He often played out wide on the left, given his attacking capabilities, but these days, he would walk straight into almost every Premier League team as a tailor-made attacking modern-day fullback. Fourth, Leighton Baines. No left-back has made more appearances during the Premier League era than Leighton Baines. Indeed, no fullback has made more appearances than the scouse Roberto Carlos, as he is very rarely known, during that time. Despite only ever playing for two teams and spending his first four seasons playing outside of the Premier League, Leighton Baines went on to amass 420 top flight appearances, which is more than the likes of Ashley Cole and Gary Neville. Baines didn't just play a lot of football in the Premier League, though. He was also, consistently, one of the outstanding fullbacks in the division. Often played out wide on the left, or even in central midfield as an academy player, it was at Wigan Athletic that Baines transitioned to left-back, finding an awful lot of joy in the position. Baines delighted in the extra time on the ball that is afforded to fullbacks compared to midfield players, whilst also bombing forward on a frequent basis and putting his trademark left-footed deliveries into the box. A set-piece specialist with a wonderful left foot, Baines scored more than 30 Premier League goals and made more than 50 assists. Dependable defensively, a real weapon going forwards, and remarkably consistent, Baines was, for a number of years, one of the best left-backs in the world and he twice made the PFA Team of the Year and thrice won Everton's Players' Player of the Year award. Only the presence of Ashley Cole prevented him from winning at least half a century of caps for England, but he must still go down as one of the finest fullbacks that we have seen in the Premier League, and his spot in fourth is reflective of that fact. Third, Patrice Sevra. Patrice Evra might be as mad as a box of frogs off the pitch, whether he is karate kicking a Marseille fan or kissing a whole raw chicken on Instagram. But on the pitch, he was exceptional. Brought in by Sir Alex Ferguson, along with Nemanja Vidic in the January 2006 transfer window, Evra made his name at Monaco, where he had already reached a Champions League final and made the league and team of the year two seasons earlier. The professionalism and culture that existed at Manchester United at the time, though, brought out yet new heights in the Frenchman's game as he quickly established himself as one of the most capable and complete fullbacks in the Premier League. Although Evra was quick, gifted on the ball, and always attacked with purpose, he didn't score or assist a great number of goals. Defensively, however, both in terms of his positioning and his aggression, he was uncompromising and a nightmare to play against. Evra only made 278 Premier League appearances, the second fewest of anyone in this set, behind Andy Robertson and all but five of them came at Manchester United. That perhaps prevents him from stealing a spot in second, but based upon his talent and consistency, playing for a team that was competing for the biggest trophies virtually every season that he was at the club, I think that Evra is great value for a podium finish. Second, Dennis Irwin. Fullbacks who are best associated with Manchester United take both third and second place in this seven, and Dennis Irwin left Manchester United just four years before Patrice ever arrived. Irwin made 328 Premier League appearances in total, and that is pretty remarkable when you take a look at his overall career. An Irishman who was born in Cork, Irwin spent seven seasons in the English game, making almost 300 appearances for both Leeds United and Oldham Athletic before joining Manchester United shortly before he turned 25. 
Irwin's first two seasons of football at Old Trafford, came prior to the Premier League's breakaway, meaning that he was almost 27 years old and had already made 389 appearances when he finally made his Premier League debut. What's more, when he finally left Manchester United after more than a decade at the club, Irwin dropped down into the first division with Wolverhampton Wanderers only to win promotion at the first attempt and get one last season of Premier League football under his belt in which he played 32 times. A right-footed free-kick specialist who played the bulk of his football at left-back due to Manchester United being more in need of a left-back than a right-back, Irwin was two-footed, relentlessly consistent and probably could have done a job in just about any position. The most consistent players rarely drop below a 7 out of 10, but Irwin rarely dropped below an 8 and frequently put in performances of the very highest calibre. When Alex Ferguson was asked to pick an all-time 11, he said Irwin would be the first name on his team sheet ahead of the likes of Wayne Rooney and Cristiano Ronaldo for exactly that reason. I think there might have been a touch of Fergie hyperbole in there, but Irwin was outstanding and his spot in second place was never up for too much debate in my mind. First, Ashley Cole. I noticed one or two comments on previous videos from Chelsea fans in this series claiming that I clearly absolutely despise Chelsea by virtue of some of my selections. In case there was any doubt, I can confirm that I don't absolutely despise Chelsea, at least no more than I despise every team that isn't Hull City and Cape Coast Ebba Sewer Dwarfs, my first and second teams. Hopefully I have gone some way towards illustrating that fact by putting Ashley Cole in top spot in this seven, though I must say, again, that I didn't do that to appease Chelsea fans, but because I think Ashley Cole is without any shadow of a doubt the greatest left-back of the Premier League era. Born in London's East End, Cole came through the youth ranks at Arsenal, and it didn't take him long to establish himself for both club and country. A star man from a very young age, Cole had searing pace and was fantastic on the ball at that age. His 2006 transfer to Chelsea, by which stage Cole was already arguably the best left back in world football, caused a mountain of controversy, and also made him a bit of a whipping boy among the English press and a certain section of England supporters. In spite of that fact, Cole was one of the very few players, if not in fact the only one of England's star players during the so-called golden generation, who managed to replicate their club form on the international stage. Under Jose Mourinho, Cole became a little less adventurous and a little bit more tamed, but defensively, he became even more astute whilst posing a threat in the opposition's half just a little bit less often. Cristiano Ronaldo labelled Cole as his toughest opponent, and the four-time PFA Team of the Year inclusion certainly proved his class time and time again against the very best in the business. He is the only player in this seven, I would contest, who was, for a number of years, the best left-back in world football. Combine that with the fact that he played 400 Premier League games at the very highest level for both Arsenal and Chelsea, very rarely letting either side down. For me, Cole is among the easiest inclusions in any Premier League era best 11, despite some outstanding competition at left-back. That is it for my seven, but I promised you some extremely honourable mentions, and I wasn't lying. Wayne Bridge for me, is very unfortunate not to make the cut, and were it not for the presence of Ashley Cole at both England and when he ought to have been hitting his peak at Chelsea, I suspect he would have made it. John Arnorisa was a fantastic fullback who was exhilarating to watch and was adored by Liverpool fans. I just think that there have been seven superior Premier League left-backs to him, and had he featured, it would have had to have been Robertson who missed out. Stuart Pearce misses out, primarily because he played a lot of his football prior to the creation of the Premier League, including some of his best football, and therefore just didn't quite have the quantity or quality of football to make the cut. Albeit, it was very tight. Joao Cancelo is an even more extreme example of that, and would surely make a right or left-back seven in years to come, were he to spend, I'd say, at least five, probably six seasons in English football's top flight. Elsewhere, other left-backs who made my shortlist, but not quite my final seven, include the likes of Stig Inga Bjornby, Danny Rose, David Unsworth, Phil Neville, Gail Cliche, Alan Wright, Ian Hart, Luke Shaw, and Celestine Babiaro. 
I'm sure those mentions of Danny Rose, and Luke Shaw will seem generous to some at this moment in time, but Rose is actually a two-time PFA Team of the Year inclusion, who has made more than 200 Premier League appearances and was brilliant at his peak. Meanwhile, Luke Shaw has already made the same number of Premier League appearances as Rose at the age of only 26. He too has made the PFA Team of the Year twice, and were it not for that horrific double leg break when he was just really starting to come good and was still very young, I suspect that he would be in this seven by now. Seventh, Jordan Henderson. Jordan Henderson is quite possibly the most underrated Premier League player of all time, and I must admit, it took me far longer than it ought to have done to fully appreciate him. It must be said, Henderson wasn't always as good as he has been in the last few years. I don't think there can be any doubt that his game has come on leaps and bounds since Jurgen Klopp arrived at Anfield in 2015. But objectively, even taking that into account, I think he has to feature in a seven of this ilk. To begin with, Henderson has played 381 games in the Premier League. That is an enormous number of games, and the Liverpool captain is still only 31 years old, meaning that he could easily have another 100 to 150 top flight appearances left in the tank. When Jordan Henderson joined Liverpool from Sunderland in 2011, I think a lot of people doubted his ability to make it at Anfield. Indeed, Brendan Rodgers even wanted to sell Henderson to Fulham in a swap deal involving Clint Dempsey in 2012 before Henderson was persuaded otherwise by Stuart Downing. Even by 2015, when Henderson was a regular starter for Liverpool, a lot of people questioned whether he had what it would take to replace Steven Gerrard as the Reds club captain. Six years later, Henderson has done something that Gerrard couldn't in lifting both the Premier League and the Champions League as Liverpool captain, and he has been integral to both of those successes. A fantastic professional with a brilliant footballing brain, an awful lot of people underestimate Henderson's role in Liverpool's success in recent years. Very rarely wasteful in possession, Henderson has a fantastic engine, and I still think Liverpool look far weaker when he is out of the side. Fun fact, despite only having the 47th most appearances of any player during the Premier League era, Henderson has already made more passes than any other Premier League player. Sixth, Fernandinho. We kickstart this seven with two current Premier League midfielders as Fernandinho comes one place ahead of Jordan Henderson. Fernandinho has played far fewer Premier League games than Henderson, 124 fewer to be exact, but every one of them has come at the very highest level, for a Man City team competing for the league title in virtually every one of those seasons. It is worth noting that Fernandinho was already 28 years old when he arrived in the Premier League, signed by Man City from Shakhtar Donetsk. So it is a measure of his extraordinary longevity within the game that he still makes a seven of this calibre. I actually think Fernandinho probably played his very best football between 2017 and 2019, so between the ages of 32 and 34. And even now, at the age of 36, he remains utterly brilliant almost whenever he plays. There were times though, particularly during the time frame that I just mentioned, under Pep Guardiola, when I thought a case could be made that Fernandinho was Manchester City's single most important player. They say that tackling in football is a dying art, but it would appear as though Fernandinho didn't get the memo. He is an absolute master at selecting the best possible action in defensive situations, whether that be a neat interception, a first slide tackle, or sometimes just a gentle nudging off the ball. His work rate, combined with his reading of the game, gave the sense that he was everywhere at his best, and he was very visibly an absolute nightmare to play against. If you look at Manchester City's points per game with and without Fernandinho during Pep Guardiola's first three seasons at the club, the contrast is stark, illustrating his importance. I long felt that replacing him would be Pep's toughest job, but in the form of Rodri, the Citizens appear to have another future Premier League great. Fifth, Angolo Kante. Angolo Kante has by far the fewest Premier League appearances under his belt to date of any player in this set so it is a mark of his extraordinary impact during that time that I still felt obliged to include him. Brought to the Premier League by Leicester City, really as a replacement for veteran midfielder Esteban Cambiasso, Kante had big boots to fill, and was 
relatively unknown in England at the time, having just played his first season of top flight football in France for Cannes. It didn't take long for everyone in England to know the name N'Golo Kante though, and pretty soon, everyone with any interest in football across the entire world. His performances during his single season at Leicester City, as the Foxes won the most unlikely of Premier League titles, were astounding, both in terms of the amount of ground that he covered, how often he won the ball, and how few mistakes he made. The following season, he joined Chelsea, and it was little coincidence that it was Antonio Conte's men who won the Premier League following that signing. Kante has had some injury problems over the last few years, and there have been some disagreements regarding his best position. But he showed yet again in last season's Champions League, as he won the Man of the Match award in both legs of Chelsea's semi-final ties with Real Madrid, and in the final against Man City, that at his best, he is simply one of the most effective players in world football. Only a lack of games and seasons prevented him from making a podium finish in this seven. And if I were to make this video in, say, two or three years' time, I suspect that he would finish at least third. Fourth, Paul Ince. I'll let you in on a little secret. The way in which I make a video in a series like this one, which isn't a wholly original idea, that is to say, I'm not the first person to ponder who are the greatest Premier League players in a certain position, is that I draw up a big shortlist, about 30 players long in the case of today's video, I pick my seven, I order them, and then I take a look at what other people have written and said on the same subject. I do it in that order to make sure that I'm not influenced by other people's views, and so that I don't fall into the wretched trap of groupthink. And I mainly just look to make sure that I haven't been daft and forgotten anyone really obvious, but also out of idle curiosity. Typically, there is plenty of overlap in terms of who features, unsurprisingly, but a number of discrepancies in their order. Rarely is it really shocking, you know, like a list of the Premier League's 10 greatest goalkeepers that doesn't include Peter Schmeichel or Petr Cech and has Jorelio Gomez in top spot. But the exclusion of Paul Ince from virtually every list that I could find, ranking great Premier League midfielders, defensive or otherwise, would seem to be bitterly unfair to me. Ince only very narrowly missed out on my top three, but I do have a theory as to why he doesn't get anywhere near the credit that he deserves. Ince spent six years at Manchester United, half of which he spent as arguably the best midfielder in English football but his reputation with United fans was badly damaged after he joined Liverpool in 1997. Liverpool fans didn't dislike Ince because of his past, but he only spent two seasons at Anfield, having spent far longer and played his best football at Old Trafford. So, he isn't really a Liverpool legend, so to speak. So when these discussions about the greatest Premier League midfielders come up and Liverpool fans passionately make the case for Steven Gerrard and Manchester United fans for Roy Keane and Paul Scholes and so on, there is no major club supporters with the love of Paul Ince to really make his case. The club where he perhaps retains the most affection, in terms of super clubs at least, if anything might be Inter Milan, who obviously are not relevant to a conversation surrounding the Premier League. Ince played as both a defensive and as a box-to-box -box midfielder, and given his rock-solid defensive credentials, his output in terms of goals and assists is actually really rather impressive, and among the finest in this seven. A quick, tireless, and powerful runner in midfield, Ince was tenacious in the tackle, economical in his use of the ball, and majestic in transition. Despite playing seven seasons of first-team football prior to the creation of the Premier League and spending two of his best years at Inter Milan, Ince still managed to make more than 300 Premier League appearances. A three-time PFA Team of the Year inclusion, who also made the Premier League's Team of the Decade in 2002, if Ince had spent his entire career playing in the Premier League, he would have made at least my top three. Third, Michael Carrick. Both Michael Carrick and Paul Ince were midfielders who came through the youth ranks at West Ham and played their best football at Manchester United. But the similarities just about end there. While Stince was renowned for his stamina, his running, and his all-action approach, Carrick was a much more relaxed presence on a football pitch. Throughout his entire career, even from youth team level, Carrick was never really the star man in any team that he played in, and he only ever won 34 caps for England. In spite of those facts, he also vastly improved every single team that he ever played in. And it is quite possible that England would have been far better served by giving Carrick greater game time. 
as the three Lions persisted with a dysfunctional two-man midfield. Carrick's arrival at Manchester United from Tottenham in 2006, where he was partnered with a 31-year-old Paul Scholes, saw Alex Ferguson switch up his style of play. Man United drifted away from their fast, aggressive counter-attacking style of the 1990s and early 2000s towards something a bit more continental and a bit more of a possession-based approach. That may have been a conscious decision that Sir Alex made, but it was also a necessity, given the fact that neither Carrick nor Scholes were physically brilliant, but both read the game brilliantly, were excellent on the ball, and were masters in the pass. Carrick was often overshadowed by Skulls, though there is no shame in that, but his distribution was integral to how Manchester United played. Carrick's touch, awareness and vision were all world-class for more than a decade, and whilst I do think that there have been three better non-attack midfielders in the history of the Premier League at their peaks, I don't think that there are three who have been greater. Carrick made 481 Premier League appearances, which is a century more games in the division than any other player in this set. Second, Patrick Vieira. Whilst Patrick Vieira did, at times, play in defence midfield, particularly as he got a bit older, I would not say he was primarily a defensive midfielder. The Frenchman arrived in the Premier League in 1996 from AC Milan, joining Arsenal under Arsene Wenger. As I described in the introduction, that was a time when the Premier League was heavily populated by midfielders with a bit of everything, who could run for 90 minutes and contribute both defensively and going forward. Vieira fit that mould and he almost immediately became the very best at performing those functions in the entire division. Quite the sight out on a football pitch, Vieira is 6 foot 4 inches tall and about 5 foot of that appeared to be his legs. Though lanky in appearance, Vieira was a fantastic athlete with outstanding technique. His ability to somehow wrap his long legs round a player, cleanly dispossessing them of the ball when they looked to have been in the clear, never ceased to dumbfound his opponents. On the ball, Vieira was extremely intelligent, knowing just when to slow the game down, keep hold of the ball, or run at the opposition. When he chose the latter, in full flow, he presented a pretty terrifying threat. All in all, Vieira's ability to win the ball, keep the ball, and make things happen, whilst being relentlessly driven, consistent, and an outstanding leader, make him one of the Premier League's greatest ever midfielders, and among the finest to have played the game during my lifetime. What's more, he made more than 300 Premier League appearances, 279 of them coming at Arsenal, where he won three Premier League titles. Vieira made the PFA Team of the Year six times in nine seasons at Arsenal, a tally which is bettered only by Steven Gerrard during the Premier League era, who spent many more seasons in the division, and Vieira also joined Paul Ince in the Premier League's earliest team of the decade. All things considered, he was nailed on for a spot in my top two. First, Roy Keane. As with Patrick Vieira, Roy Keane wasn't a classic defensive midfielder. Certainly not during his first decade in the game, but he was often the least attacking player in a central midfield pairing at Manchester United. Throughout most of the 1990s, Keane played in a very similar role to Patrick Vieira, with whom he shared so many famous battles. That is to say, he covered an awful lot of ground, he contributed a great deal in both attack and defence, and he impacted the totality of a game. All of that was made possible by Keane's outstanding stamina and aggression, combined with one of the best first touches in the game, and a directness and accuracy about his passing that made him tailor-made for how Sir Alex Ferguson wanted his side to play. In his later years, Keane did start to drop a little bit deeper, as certain physical attributes inevitably began to wane, but there another one of Keane's outstanding attributes was brought even further to the fore. His footballing intelligence. Both on and off the ball, in terms of his positioning and decision-making, Keane was almost flawless, aside from suffering from the occasional rush of blood and doing something a little bit daft. Keane's hot-headedness is often how he is defined these days, particularly by those who never really saw him play. But in reality, whilst his aggression and determination transformed Manchester United into a title-winning machine, Keane was, above all else, just an outstanding footballer. To my mind, he is the greatest midfielder, defensive, central or attacking, of the Premier League era, and arguably the greatest player in any position. Again, 
That is not to say that he is the best player, though I think a case could be made for him having been the best midfielder, since greatness measures something slightly different. Keane played 366 games in the Premier League, all but 40 of them, coming at Manchester United. For more than a decade, he set the standard at Old Trafford as much as Sir Alex Ferguson, both on a match day and particularly in training, and I don't think any other single player has exerted such great influence upon the division. Keane made the PFA Team of the Century in 2007, and I don't think any Premier League Era 11 would be complete without having him in it. That is it for my seven, but there are plenty of honourable mentions, some of whom might require some explanation as to why they were left out. Gilberto Silva and Xabi Alonso were perhaps the two toughest defence midfielders to leave out, along with Claude Makélélé, all three of whom were absolutely sensational throughout their time in English football's top flight. I think all three were better players than Michael Carrick, who took third place in my seven, albeit they were all fairly different. But whilst Carrick played 481 games in the Premier League, Gilberto Silva played just 170 games, Claude Makélélé 144, and Xabi Alonso 143. Given the strength of the seven and the criteria of quality and quantity of performances in the division, begrudgingly, I had to leave all three out. Current Premier League midfielders such as Fabinho, Rodri and Declan Rice have the potential, I think, to make a seven of this ilk in the future, particularly the latter two. But obviously, it is just far too early for all three in terms of seasons and games played for them to feature. Other candidates on my shortlist who didn't quite make the cut include the likes of Javier Mascherano, Danny Murphy, David Batty, Darren Fletcher, Nemanja Matic, Michael Essien, Gary Speed, Nicky Butt, Emmanuel Petit, Gareth Barry, Lee Bowyer, Tim Sherwood, Scott Parker, and George Boateng. A special mention for Michael Essien, who I think, without injuries, would have become an all-time Premier League great midfielder. 7th. Yaya Torre. When Manchester City signed Yaya Torre in the summer of 2010, it was obvious that they had signed a player of real pedigree, and someone who would help take them up a notch as a team. Having said that, it also seemed as though he would be exerting his influence upon games from defensive midfield, since that is where he had predominantly played at Barcelona, and he even played the entire 2009 Champions League final against Manchester United as a centre-back, keeping a clean sheet no less. Torre had in fact begun his career as a centre-forward though, and he would prove himself at Manchester City to be one of the most versatile and complete players in world football. It was hard to nail Torre down as either an attacking or defensive midfielder for the purpose of this series, since he played in both positions so expertly in the Premier League, quite often within the same game. His very best performances though, and his very best season, which I would rank as one of the greatest single seasons that any player has had in the entire history of the Premier League, came primarily whilst he was playing further forward. The season that I'm referring to is of course the 2013-14 campaign, when he became the first midfielder other than Frank Lampard and arguably Matt Letizia, both of whom also only did it once to score 20 goals in the Premier League. Torre was virtually unplayable that season, steamrolling opponents both on and off the ball, dragging Manchester City up the pitch, and scoring and creating goals at will. In total, Torre played 230 Premier League games, which is almost a third of the number of Premier League appearances that one player in this seven racked up, and for that, he is inevitably punished. Nonetheless, the vast majority of those 230 appearances were of the very highest quality and Torre is, without doubt, one of the seven finest attack midfielders, when he played there, that we have seen in the Premier League. So he gets us started. Sixth, Kevin De Bruyne. For my money, Kevin De Bruyne is the best midfielder that we have seen in the Premier League. And were this seven simply ranking the best attack midfielders of the Premier League era, rather than the greatest, he would take top spot. The only thing holding De Bruyne back and... I really do mean pretty much the only thing is his lack of appearances in relation to the rest of this seven, and indeed, the vast majority of my shortlist. De Bruyne has made 198 Premier League appearances at the time of this recording, 195 of them coming at Manchester City, though he could well have hit the 200 mark by the time that this video comes out. 
That is the fewest number of Premier League appearances registered by anyone in this seven, and I think I'm right in saying that Trent Alexander-Arnold is the only player to feature in this series who has played fewer. Much like Alexander-Arnold, De Bruyne is the primary creative cog in a world-class team and one of the finest crosses of a ball on the planet. Capable of playing in central midfield or out wide, I think De Bruyne is at his most devastating in something akin to a number 10 position, whilst veering into that right-hand channel where his deliveries are practically lethal. In seven seasons of Premier League football at the Etihad, De Bruyne has made the PFA Team of the Year thrice, he has been named as the Players' Player of the Year twice, and the Premier League Player of the Season once. Quite simply, a joy to watch, De Bruyne is the most incisive passer of ball to have played in the Premier League. He very rarely loses the ball, and he frequently produces something quite spectacular. What's more, he provides all of the wizardry and invention of a luxury player, whilst also being a very good athlete, covering plenty of ground and never looking anything like a passenger. In total, De Bruyne has made 80 assists and scored 49 goals in 198 Premier League games. And by the time he hangs up his boots, assuming that he stays in the Premier League for another three or four years, there is every chance that he will go down as one of the league's greatest players of all time. Fifth. Cesc Fabregas Whilst I think Kevin De Bruyne is a more complete midfielder than Cesc Fabregas, the Spaniard played 350 Premier League games, which is around 150 games more than the Belgian has to date. Fabregas probably ranks among at least the five finest teenage footballers of my lifetime, and probably the top three, and his 2009-10 season is, to my mind, perhaps the most underrated campaign of the Premier League era. Not so much at the time, I don't think, when everyone knew that Fabregas was destined for the bright lights of the camp now, but nowadays, few people give that Arsenal era Fabregas the respect that he, and it, truly deserve. I suspect that is because Fabregas sullied his reputation at Arsenal a little with the 2010 World Cup shirt incident, followed by his move to Chelsea. But there is no partisanship on this channel. Fabregas scored 15 goals and made 13 assists, in 27 Premier League games in the 2009-10 season, giving him a record of better than one goal contribution per game. Even Frank Lampard never managed that, although he did come very close during that exact same season. An artist with the ball at his feet, Fabregas was already the main man at Arsenal at the age of only 19, and he returned to the Premier League in style with Chelsea in 2014. In his first season back in England, Fabregas came close to eclipsing Thierry Henry's Premier League assist record, putting the ball on a plate for his teammates 18 times as Chelsea lifted the Premier League title. In total, Fabregas made 111 Premier League assists, a tally which is bettered only by Ryan Giggs, who played close to twice as many Premier League games as him. Fourth, David Silva. I never have a definitive answer when people ask me what is the finest performance that I've ever seen live and in the flesh, but one of them was certainly David Silva against Hull City at what was then named the Casey Stadium in the 2013-14 Premier League season. I was intrigued then, if not all that surprised, when I saw that Silva picked out that game as his toughest fixture and Hull City as his toughest opponents from his decade at Manchester City when he left the club in 2020. Vincent Kompany was sent off only 10 minutes into that game, and were it not for David Silva, Manuel Pellegrini's side would have been in big trouble. The Spaniard was simply flawless though, barely putting a foot wrong all afternoon, dictating the tempo of the game, scoring a wonderful goal, and assisting a second. We tend to think of Silva as being a fairly quiet and unassuming character, but he routinely lifted those around him, and when he needed to, he was always ready to step up and make the difference. Now that he has left Manchester City, more and more stories are starting to come out that lift the lid on the misconception that Silva was a quiet guy, revealing that he was actually a very vocal and charismatic member of the Manchester City dressing room, and he was even pretty lively on a night out. There is very little to critique about Silva's game itself. A magician with the ball at his feet, but also a real workhorse, Silva's work rate was phenomenal, whether he was being played out wide, in central midfield, or as a number 10. In 10 seasons of Premier League football, during which time he played 309 games, Silva hardly ever put a foot wrong. 
He wasn't as prolific as others in this seven in terms of his goal scoring, though he still managed to bag 12 goals in his highest scoring campaign and he has made more Premier League assists than the likes of Steven Gerrard, David Beckham and Thierry Henry. Silva somehow doesn't seem quite as blockbuster as other all-time Premier League greats. Maybe he just has slightly fewer Hollywood moments to his record. And his achievements came in a team that were often mechanically efficient and suffocated their opponents, but only three outstanding midfielders who all played far more games than him in the Premier League finish ahead of him in my seven. Third, Steven Gerrard. The top three in this seven was always likely to be the most controversial segment of this entire series, and however I ordered them, I would be irritating someone. I have ranked Steven Gerrard as the third greatest attacking midfielder of the Premier League era, and I will explain why, starting with why he makes a podium finish before exploring why he doesn't take top spots, which Liverpool fans, and I'm sure many neutrals, will no doubt feel as though he should. Gerrard is probably the single most complete footballer to have played in the Premier League. I don't think that he is the greatest Premier League player in terms of any single attribute, whether that be passing, tackling, technique or finishing, but he was so good at all of them, and many others, that the final product was something really quite special. An inspirational captain, in addition to being a world-class midfielder, Gerrard lifted Liverpool in a way that no other player in this seven had to lift the standard of their own teams, and in a way that, one doubts, any of the others could. Gerrard proved his range of abilities by playing just off Fernando Torres almost as a second striker and scoring 16 Premier League goals in the 2008-09 season, before dropping much, much deeper, operating almost as a sweeper at times under Brendan Rodgers, as Liverpool came within inches of lifting the 2013-14 Premier League title. As I said in the introduction, the fact that Gerrard doesn't have a Premier League winner's medal has no bearing on his position in this seven. But the fact that he doesn't have title-deciding moments to his name in the Premier League, like he does in so many other competitions, does. Gerrard was someone who, whilst very consistent, was also capable of producing really spectacular moments which could turn a game in an instant. And were I ranking the top three in this seven beyond just the Premier League, perhaps the order that I've given would be somewhat different. In terms of the numbers in the Premier League, Gerrard played 504 Premier League games, the joint 11th most of the Premier League era. He made 92 Premier League assists, which is the 7th most of the Premier League era, and he scored 120 Premier League goals, the 19th most, again, of the Premier League era. Gerrard made the PFA Team of the Year eight times, which is more inclusions than any other top fight player since 1992, and serves as a very useful reminder of his relentless brilliance in the division, despite failing to get his hands on the trophy itself. Second, Frank Lampard. Statistically, Frank Lampard is the greatest midfielder of the Premier League era. First and foremost, Lampard played far more Premier League games than anyone else in this seven, racking up 609 Premier League appearances in total. That is over 100 more Premier League appearances than his longtime international teammate Steven Gerrard. 429 of Lampard's Premier League appearances came at Chelsea, where he spent the bulk of his career and indeed his best years becoming the Blues' all-time top scorer. Meanwhile, he made just shy of 150 Premier League appearances for West Ham United and exactly 32 appearances during a single season on loan at Manchester City. Lampard is often talked about in terms of his goals from midfield, for obvious reasons, so I shouldn't gloss over them either. Lampard struck 177 times in the Premier League, putting him fifth in the Premier League era scoring charts ahead of the likes of Michael Owen and Thierry Henry. Bearing in mind, that Lampard played in midfield. He is also one of only four players to make more than 100 assists during the Premier League era, putting him ahead of both Steven Gerrard and Dennis Bergkamp in that regard. It would be wrong to talk about Lampard solely in terms of numbers though. Whilst he was relentless in terms of goal contributions, having worked tirelessly to become so efficient in front of goal, he was also extremely cute and intelligent, both on and off the ball. Some of Lampard's one- and two-touch football often gets overlooked, as does the subtlety of his movement, late arrivals into the box, and overlapping runs, particularly in tandem with Didier Drogba. I think a really compelling case could be made that Steven Gerrard was a better all-round midfielder 
than Frank Lampard. But comparing the two only in terms of quality and quantity of performance in the Premier League, Lampard just edges it for me. First, Paul Scholes. I know that Paul Scholes has become someone that divides opinion, and maybe that is fair enough in regard to his punditry and his Instagram behaviour, but as a footballer, I think that is fairly absurd. The notion that Scholes was not as revered as Lampard and Gerrard during their playing days and that his reputation within the game has been inflated since he retired does not ring true, at least in terms of my own appreciation of Scholes. And it certainly doesn't ring true in terms of others within the game. Throughout his time at Manchester United and with England, it was not a very well-kept secret that Scholes was among the most gifted and important players within the Premier League. A man who made football look very easy, if you talk to anyone who played against Scholes, they'll tell you that, though he was never the quickest, it seemed impossible to get anywhere near him. In his early years, Scholes played in attacking midfield, and almost as a second striker just behind Ruud van Nistelrooy in the early 2000s. In the second half of the 2000s, after Roy Keane left Manchester United and Michael Carrick arrived, Scholes dropped much deeper, becoming the best deep line playmaker in the Premier League. At his best, Scholes was as devastating as Lampard whilst playing as a number 10, and as influential as someone like Xavi or Perlo in terms of collecting the ball off his centre-backs, distributing the ball, and controlling the tempo and rhythm of a game from central or holding midfield. That just shows what a special player Scholes really was. And whilst there are other reasons that I could mention, the simple fact that I think Paul Scholes was a better footballer and a more gifted midfielder dictates the fact that he finishes ahead of Gerrard and Lampard. Albeit, I don't think that there is a fat lot in it, and anyone who suggests that one of them is just miles ahead of the others is being deceptive. It's sometimes said that Scholes being pushed out wide for England is evidence that he was the weakest of the three. But I think that says more, in a negative sense at least, about Sven than it does about Scholes. Between Gerard Lampard and Scholes, which has become a borderline obsessive debate now, even after all three have retired, I think Gerard was the best all-rounder, Lampard was obviously the most prolific and dependable in the final third, and Scholes was the most gifted and certainly the best in terms of running a game. As I said, I actually think that Kevin De Bruyne is a better player than all three, but comparing them based upon quality and quantity of performances in the Premier League, that is the order that I settled upon. That is it for my seven, but there are a great many honourable mentions that I ought to rattle through as quickly as possible. JJ Kocha and Matt Letizia are arguably just as, if not even more gifted, than anyone in this seven along with the likes of Janinho, Mesut Ozil, and even Dimitri Payet, despite not sticking around for long, all of whom provided us with some unforgettable Premier League moments. Current Premier League midfielders, such as Bruno Fernandes and Ilkay Gundogan, are certainly capable of becoming all-time greats, as is Philippe Coutinho, I suppose, if his start to life back in England is anything to go on. Elsewhere, midfielders who made my shortlist but not quite my final seven, included the likes of Aaron Ramsey, Mikel Arteta, Kieran Dyer, Jack Wilshire, Adam Lallana, Deli Alley, Kevin Nolan, Luka Modric, Gary McAllister, Christian Eriksen, Tim Cahill, Gianfranco Zola, Rude Hullett, Samir Nasri, Juan Mata, Ray Parler, and Jamie Redknapp, among many others. I think you will agree that they are an eclectic bunch containing a handful of truly outstanding players. But personally, I don't think many of them could stake a really solid claim to crack into my top seven. Seventh, Riyad Mahrez. I have been on a bit of a journey when it comes to Riyad Mahrez, from thinking that he was just playing out of his skin and on confidence in Leicester City's unlikely title winning season, to realising that he is actually a pretty special player. I now find myself defending Mares from what I often consider to be fairly baseless criticisms since his £60 million move to Manchester City in 2018. The French-born Algerian international who grew up in the suburbs of Paris is often accused of being inconsistent, but that couldn't really be any further from the truth. In reality, Mares is among the most consistent and productive players in the Premier League, and he has been for some time, it is just the case that Pep Guardiola frequently rests and rotates him, giving that perception, I think, 
of inconsistency. That has negative implications for Mares in terms of a 7 such as this, since it means that his contribution has been limited in a way in which no other player in this 7s has, and that is one of the reasons why he only finishes 7th despite being just as, if not even more gifted, than a few of the players ahead of him. Mares honed his skills on the streets of one of Paris's many bonniers. Always incredibly gifted, his slight build and general lack of physicality prevented him from joining a professional club until the age of 19, and he wouldn't make his professional debut until the age of 20. In January 2014, Mares joined Leicester City, helping the Foxes to win promotion from the Championship, Premier League Survival, and then the Premier League title within the space of just two and a half years. Very much a modern-day inverted winger, Mares tends to operate on the right despite being fairly one-footed in favour of his left, but his ability on the ball is such that few fullbacks are able to stop him from cutting inside and wreaking havoc. Undoubtedly, one of the finest wide players in world football over the last, well, six or seven years now, Mares has made 244 Premier League appearances in total, scoring 73 goals, making 50 assists, and he won both the PFA Fans and PFA Players Player of the Year awards in the 2015-16 season, as the most gifted member of Leicester's history-making and Premier League title-winning squad. Sixth, Joe Cole. One of many players to feature in this series who is tough to nail down to a specific position, it is my opinion that Joe Cole should never have become a winger at all and certainly not the type of traditional mid-2000s wide man that Jose Mourinho turned him into. A street footballer, a bit like Riyad Mahrez in that regard, Joe Cole was also pretty diminutive when he broke through, but on the ball, he was quite frightening. I would go as far as to suggest that, as a teenager, Cole was the most technically gifted player in this seven, and when you see some of the players who are to come, that is one hell of a claim. During his early years at West Ham, playing alongside the likes of Rio Ferdinand, Frank Lampard, Paolo Di Canio and Michael Carrick, Cole played essentially in a free role, afforded a great deal of freedom by manager Harry Redknapp. At that time, Cole looked like he could become the next Gaza, and I don't think that is being hyperbolic in the slightest. Had he been Spanish or Italian, I think there is a decent chance that he would have won a Ballon d'Or, or at least come close. But Cole still went on to have a magnificent career, even if he was misused, in my opinion. His 378 Premier League appearances were split fairly evenly between the right and left flanks and attacking midfield, but he played slightly more games on the right, hence why this is the seven that he is designated to. A three-time Premier League title winner, Cole made the PFA Team of the Year in the 2005-06 season and he was Chelsea's Player of the Year for the 2007-08 campaign, seeing off competition from the likes of Frank Lampard and Didier Drogba. Inventive and explosive, Cole had a catalogue of tricks up his sleeve and was almost unplayable at his very best. Without persistent injury problems, which ended his Premier League career at the age of 33, I suspect he would have finished fourth had he maximised his true potential and avoided injuries, possibly first. Fifth, Freddy Lundberg. Fun fact, did you know that Freddy Lundberg's first name is actually Carl? That's right, the Swede's full name is in fact Carl Frederick Lundberg. No one calls him Carl, though it was only in England that he picked up the nickname Freddy, and most people in Sweden still just call him Frederick. None of that is relevant in the slightest to Lundberg's ability on a football pitch or his accomplishments in the Premier League. Though, he might not have got quite as much modelling work as he did had he been known as Carl. My apologies to any Carls that might be watching this video, let it be known that that is a reflection only of the shallow-minded world of modelling and not a reflection of my own personal prejudices. Another fairly late developer, in terms of his size, Lundberg took a little bit of time to really get going at Helmstad prior to his move to Arsenal. At number 10 at the time, Lundberg also took a season to adapt to life in England, but once he got going, he became a real force on either flank. Sweden's answer to David Beckham, Lundberg was a man of many hairstyles and even more talents. The majority of Lundberg's appearances in the Premier League, all but 25 of which came at Arsenal, came on the right flank with Robert Perez playing out on the left and Dennis Bergkamp tending to operate as a second striker. 
As cold as ice in front of goal, Lundberg always seemed to be relaxed and undaunted by the size of any occasion. Perhaps that is why he developed such a useful knack of scoring at key moments in the biggest games. Admittedly, a number of those goals came in cup competitions and are therefore irrelevant to this seven. But it is telling that Manchester City, Manchester United and Tottenham are the three teams that he scored against most frequently. In total, Lundberg played 241 Premier League games, scoring 48 goals and making 29 assists. He won the Premier League Player of the Season award in 2001-02 ahead of his teammate Thierry Henry, in addition to making the Premier League's 2002 Overseas Team of the Decade. Fourth, Steve McManaman. When the first of the United Kingdom's COVID-19 related lockdowns hit back in March 2020, ITV decided to broadcast Euro 96 in full. I was a toddler when Euro 96 took place, so much to my girlfriend's delight, I took the opportunity to watch quite a lot of games. That tournament and that summer are much featured in England, and I'm sure it was brilliant to experience if, unlike me, you were over the age of one. However, I have to say, I was pretty taken aback by how poor England were. In the game against Scotland in particular, other than Gaza's famous goal, England were pretty diabolical, and I actually thought Scotland were the better team. The one exception to how underwhelming I found England in most of those lockdown Euro 96 games was Steve McManaman, who was routinely England's most dangerous and effective attacking outlet. My earliest memories of McManaman are of watching him at Real Madrid, but I must admit, it is a recurring theme whenever I rewatch Liverpool or England games or highlights from the mid to late 1990s that he leaves a big impression. McManaman actually played on the left wing for England at Euro 96, except for the quarterfinal against Spain, where he swapped positions with Darren Anderton and played on the right, but it was on the right that he played most frequently, both for Real Madrid and, more importantly, in the Premier League. McManaman's preferred position was in attacking midfield, which he felt best utilised his vision, technique and ability to run at players but he hardly ever played there due to the position being relatively redundant at the time. One of the best dribblers of a ball that the English game has ever produced, McManaman was quick and could really cross a ball. He was sometimes criticised for not scoring enough goals and he most likely would play in midfield rather than as one of three forwards were he playing today. But as an old school wide man, he was superb. McManaman played a grand total of 275 times in the Premier League, scoring 41 goals and making 59 assists. Had he spent his entire career playing in England and had his tremendous breakout campaign not come before the Premier League's breakaway from the Football League, which meant that I could not count it as part of this seven, perhaps he would have finished even higher. But all things considered, fourth seems bang on in my mind. Third, David Beckham. A man who was back in the news a week or so ago after Piers Morgan went on a rant about him not being very good at football on Twitter, David Beckham is a man who tends not to be out of the news for long. Like most people my age, I grew up idolising Beckham and trying to replicate his free kicks at the park or in a friend's back garden. Now I think that he is a moral vacuum for accepting £150 million to put a respectable veneer on a World Cup built by slave labourers an amount of money which equates to at least £23,000 for every migrant worker who has died in Qatar since the country won its greatly contested World Cup bid. As much as I think that doing that when you've already got more wealth than some countries is pretty despicable, I cannot deny that Beckham was a sensational footballer. It is sometimes said that Beckham's celebrity was greater than his actual talent, and that his talents have been greatly exaggerated due to his fame. There may be one or two people with zero interest in football who, when asked to name footballers, can only come up with Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi and David Beckham. And certainly, that would be very generous company for Beckham to keep. But among those who are interested in football, I actually think that the opposite is true. Beckham is talked about so much in terms of his off-pitch activities that his talents on it often seem to me to be diminished, if not outright dismissed. That is an injustice since Beckham was a fantastic footballer who had an enormous appetite for the sport. 
His ability from set pieces, which were among the finest in the entire history of the sport, did not come about by accident, but through hours of practice on the training ground. The same is true of his stamina, fitness, and range of passing from open play. Bex was never a brilliant dribbler of the ball, nor was he the quickest, but his vision and movement were outstanding, hence why he later transitioned to play in central midfield. Beckham left the English game in the summer of 2003, having just turned 28, never to return, but he still managed to play 265 Premier League games, scoring 62 goals and making 80 assists. A Ballon d'Or runner-up in 1999, Beckham made the PFA Team of the Year in four successive seasons, and his spot in third was never in too much doubt. Second, Cristiano Ronaldo. This will make me very unpopular. Of that, I am sure. But I don't care. Maybe that is being a little bit flippant. What I mean is that it would be very easy for me to make this entire series and make my selections based on how popular I think they will be, what will get the video the most likes, and the fewest disagreements down below in the comments. In fact, if you look at most lists ranking great players, that is exactly what they do. But life is too short for that, and I have laid out a very specific criteria by which metric, undeniably I think, Cristiano Ronaldo is the second greatest right winger of the Premier League era. Now, clearly, Ronaldo is the greatest player to have played in the Premier League. And by that I mean, there is no greater footballer who has graced English football since 1992. Not even Ian Ashby. But being the greatest player to have played in the Premier League is not the same thing as being the greatest player in the history of the Premier League. Thierry Henry, for example, is perhaps the greatest player to have played in the MLS, but he was outscored by Juan Pablo Angel, Kenny Cooper, Tim Cahill, and Bradley Wright Phillips during his time at New York Red Bulls. So, I wouldn't say that he was the greatest MLS player of all time. Cristiano Ronaldo was outstanding in the second half of his first stint at Manchester United where he went from being a skinny wide man who was often accused of being a show pony to a Ballon d'Or winner who scored 42 goals in a single season. It is certainly arguable that Ronaldo's 2007-08 season is the single highest peak that we have seen in the Premier League. But I think it is also indisputable that Ronaldo became a much greater Real Madrid player than Manchester United player. It is also worth stating, of course, that Ronaldo is unlikely to be remembered as a right winger, but that is where he played the majority of his games in the Premier League. Now, back in English football's top flight, of course, at the time of recording, Ronaldo has made 216 Premier League appearances, scoring 92 goals and making 32 assists, and he won the Division's Player of the Season award in both the 2006-07 and 2007-08 campaigns. First, Mohamed Salah. Again, this is going to be deemed as very controversial in the comments, but it really shouldn't. Cristiano Ronaldo has achieved a higher peak, has had a greatly superior career, and has achieved far more within the game than Mohamed Salah. That much is, once again, indisputable. And even with Salah playing absolutely out of his skin at this moment in time, age 29, I would be willing to go out on a limb and say that will remain the case up until the point at which the Egyptian retires. In the Premier League, however, which is, you know, the entire point of this series, the complexion is rather different. Both Ronaldo and Salah arrived in England as youngsters at very big clubs, but whilst Ronaldo would carve out a starting berth for himself before becoming the club's star man, Salah, like so many talented young Chelsea players, was pied out on loan and eventually sold. When he returned to England, three years later, he would make Chelsea look a little bit stupid. In his first season back in England, Salah scored 32 goals in 36 Premier League games, which is more goals than Ronaldo ever scored during a season in the Premier League, and is the most that any player has scored, whilst the league has used a 38-game season format. The current campaign is only actually Salah's fifth season of regular first-team football in the Premier League, so it speaks volumes of his contribution to the English game that he takes top spot. During that time, he has made 180 Premier League appearances, which is around 36 or one whole season's worth of games fewer than Ronaldo, yet he has scored 113 goals and made 43 assists, which 
is already 32 goal contributions more than the Portuguese legend. Salah has just been relentlessly brilliant in the Premier League and is arguably playing his very best football at the time of this video's production. There is no doubt in my mind that, at least by my criteria, in terms of the quality and quantity of his performances in the Premier League, he is the greatest right winger of the Premier League era. That may be it for my seven, but I must give full credit to those who made my shortlist and just missed out. Manchester United duo Nani and Andrea Kanchelskis were among the closest of featuring, but with only 147 and 151 Premier League appearances apiece to their names, it was always likely to be an uphill battle. Ultimately, I think Riyad Mahrez is better and more consistent than both, and he has already played far more Premier League games at the very highest level. Darren Anderton can consider himself extremely unfortunate to miss out, as can Theo Walcott, I think, given that he was excellent at his best and has played an awful lot of Premier League games. Elsewhere, the most honourable of honourable mentions go to the likes of Sebastian Larson, Damian Duff, Norberto Solano, Mark Albrighton, Aaron Lennon, Steve Stone and Sean Wright Phillips. 7th. Young Min Son. This was the most difficult seven of the series so far for me, not in terms of ordering the seven, that was the attacking midfielders video, but in terms of whittling my final shortlist of 25 down to just seven. There are two players who I found it extremely difficult to leave out, and I will explain why, along with why they did miss out, when I come to my honourable mentions. But one of the reasons they both missed out is because of the sheer brilliance of the South Korean who gets us started. I can't imagine that there are too many managers in world football, if any, who wouldn't love to have Hyung min Son within their ranks. When he arrived in the Premier League with Tottenham in 2015, purchased for £22 million from Bayer Leverkusen, he seemed like a very solid signing. He was versatile, being played in four different positions that season. He was hard-working, which was crucial, as Maurizio Pochettino looked to implement a high press at White Hart Lane, and he was clearly gifted particularly with the ball at his feet. He didn't yet appear to be someone who would be lethal for Tottenham in the final third though, nor did he seem like a natural star man, more of a very good squad player who could cover in several positions. In his debut campaign, Son scored eight goals in 40 games, only four of which came in the Premier League. But the following season, it became clear that Son had just needed a season to settle in. He bagged more than 20 goals the following season, and he has been one of the most consistent and effective forwards in the division for the last six seasons. In total, Son has scored 81 goals and has made 49 assists in 220 Premier League appearances, which is more goals than Eric Cantona and Luis Suarez, and more assists than Robert Perez. All things considered, I felt that he had to feature, and he finished only very narrowly behind the man up next. 6th, Sadio Mane. I found Sadio Mane and Son Heung-min to be two players who were pretty tough to split in the context of this seven. They are the same age, they play in the same position, obviously, they arrived in the Premier League just one year apart, and they have played a similar number of Premier League games. Oh, and crucially I suppose, they are both brilliant. Mane does have an extra year on Son in the Premier League, along with 33 extra appearances and an additional 22 goal contributions, which counted in his favour. He has also won a Premier League title, and whilst that doesn't count against Son, since it is a team and not an individual achievement, Mane had so many big moments during Liverpool's title-winning campaign, and has had more big moments in the Premier League overall, I would argue, I think with the necessary evidence, than Son has. I don't want this segment to just be a comparison of Mane and Son, but I think both are a manager's dream, in terms of their commitment, consistency, work ethic, and of course their talent. Mane seemed expensive to some people when he joined Liverpool in 2016, following two seasons with Southampton, for £34 million, but he has turned out to be an absolute bargain. Like so many Liverpool players, he has scaled new heights playing under Jurgen Klopp, and his goal-scoring record, which is almost a goal every other game at Anfield, is absolutely outstanding. Throughout much of Mane's time at Liverpool, he has been outshone by Mohamed Salah. Perhaps a little bit like Son with Kane, honestly, the similarities are endless. 
but it may surprise you to discover that Mane has made the PFA Team of the Year three times, while Salah has only made it twice. Albeit Mane has an extra couple of seasons on him. I don't think Mane is as good as Salah, despite one or two contrarian takes suggesting otherwise a couple of years ago, but I do think he is the sixth greatest left winger of the Premier League era. Fifth, Robert Pires. This seems low, to me at least, and there will be those who still feel as though it is too low after I reveal my top four, but I'll do my best to justify myself as we go along. Robert Pires spent precisely six seasons at Arsenal, and he was an absolute jewel in every single one of them. Perez brought a real elegance to the Premier League, joining an Arsenal team that already contained Dennis Bergkamp and Thierry Henry. Along with Henry, with whom he shared a dressing room at both club and international level, Perez formed what was the most lethal and the most feared left flank that the Premier League has ever seen. As with Mane and Son, with Salah and Kane, Perez was rarely seen as being the star of the show because Thierry Henry was one of the best players in world football throughout Perez's six years at the club. But it is telling that it was Perez who won the FWA Footballer of the Year award at the end of the 2001-02 season, and it was Perez who the Arsenal players knelt and bowed down before, as you can see in this photograph, after they lifted the Premier League title that season. Perez played fewer Premier League games than either Mane or Son, 198 in total, all but nine of which came at Arsenal, but his output was superb. Despite playing in a less advanced role than the two players who preceded him in this seven, Perez still managed to score 63 goals and make 42 assists in 189 Premier League games for Arsenal, which would be pretty good going nowadays and was absolutely phenomenal at the time. He scored 14 goals in three successive Premier League seasons, which is further testament to his consistency during his time at Arsenal, and only a lack of games prevents him from troubling my top three. Fourth, Gareth Bale. Perhaps the trickiest player to rank in this seven, at his best, I think Gareth Bale is the best left winger to have played in the Premier League. And yes, whilst the majority of Bale's appearances across his entire career have come on the right flank, all but around 20 of his Premier League appearances came out wide on the left, hence why he features in this seven rather than the right wing seven, just in case any of you were wondering. During the 2012-13 season, which was Bale's last at Tottenham before his move to Real Madrid, and by some distance his best, he hit a level that has been attained by very few players in the history of the division. I think a case could be made that Bale was actually individually even more brilliant that season than Cristiano Ronaldo was in any single Premier League campaign, including the 2007-08 season. I know that will seem hyperbolic, and I am not stating it outright, I'm just saying that I think it is plausible, but whilst Ronaldo played in a star-studded Manchester United team with Carlos Tevez and Wayne Rooney covering the hard yards alongside him up front, and the likes of Paul Scholes and Michael Carrick behind him, Bale played in a Spurs team which had Aaron Lennon on the opposite flank, where Clint Dempsey, Emmanuel Adebayor, and Jermaine Defoe were the next highest scorers behind him. Nonetheless, in every single game, as Tottenham finished fifth that season, you felt as though he could win it for them, and very often he did. There was a run of five games, I remember, from January to March of 2013, starting with a game against Norwich and ending with the North London derby, where Bale was as dominant as impactful and as impressive as anything that I've ever seen in the Premier League. His pace was frightening, he had confidence coursing through his veins, and every defender in the league looked absolutely petrified of him. So that is why he takes fourth, but the reality is that Bale wasn't at his 2012-13 standard or anything like it for the majority of his time in the Premier League. He played the fewest games out of anyone in this seven in the Premier League, and far fewer than the three players ahead of him. So all things considered, based on quality and quantity of performances in the league, I couldn't quite justify putting him any higher than fourth. Third, Raheem Sterling. I know full well that I'm going to get some blowback in the comments for saying that Raheem Sterling is a greater Premier League left winger than Gareth Bale, but that doesn't change the fact that I think it is true. 
As you will know, if you have been following this series, I am not trying to win any popularity contests with my selections. I'm just giving my honestly held beliefs based upon all of the available information and the stated criteria that I am using. As I just said, I think Gareth Bale at his best is the best left winger to have played in the Premier League. Raheem Sterling at his best probably isn't. You could argue he wouldn't even be among the top three. But that is not the question that is up for debate. Sterling has played 313 Premier League games, which is almost twice as many as Bale, and he has hit double figures for goals in all competitions for nine successive seasons, despite the fact that he is still only 27 years old, which is a stat that I will never tire of repeating, since I think it is fairly remarkable. Sterling has never had the kind of explosiveness of Bale at his very best, and arguably lacks the sheer elegance of a Robert Perez. But what he is, unquestionably, I would argue, is very quick, very skillful, and extremely intelligent. I have made an entire video about Raheem Sterling, in the unlikely event that you are interested in hearing me explain why I think he is so good and so often underrated, and want to go and watch it. But the condensed version is that Raheem Sterling has perhaps the finest attacking movement of anyone who has ever played in the Premier League. That is, in large part, why he has scored 106 goals and has made 73 assists in 313 Premier League outings. Which, it should be said, is more Premier League goals than Didier Drogba, who played as a centre-forward in a fantastic Chelsea team. In case any of you were wondering, Sterling has made 153 Premier League appearances on the left flank, 111 on the right flank, and 46 through the middle. So that is why he features in this seven and not any of the others. Second, Eden Hazard. I have seen some fairly dangerous revisionism creeping in to the way in which some people reflect on Eden Hazard's time in the Premier League, following his difficulties at Real Madrid, and whilst I am sure they are pretty fringe views, it would be remiss of me not to push back against them. Hazard spent seven seasons in the Premier League, and if you were to take a look at those seven seasons as a whole, I don't think you would find a better Premier League player over that period. I remember, in the summer of 2012, when I will have been 16 years old, watching England versus Belgium in what was England's final warm-up game ahead of Euro 2012. But in spite of that, much of the focus in the ground wasn't on England at all. It was on Eden Hazard, who Chelsea and Manchester United were locked in a vicious transfer battle to try and sign from Lille at the time. Alright, probably wasn't that vicious. I don't imagine that Roberto Di Matteo and Alex Ferguson were actually getting in a fight over it, but you get the idea. I hadn't seen a great deal of Hazard at the time, and playing through the middle, he had a really quiet game. On the few occasions when he got the ball, his touch was a bit sloppy and he didn't really get a sniff up against his soon-to-be teammates John Terry and Gary Cahill. I left Wembley feeling rather unimpressed by him. The next time I saw Hazard, as best as I can recall, was on the opening day of the Premier League season, on television against Wigan Athletic, where he tore Maynor Figueroa to shreds and made two assists before being substituted. Midweek, he made a hat-trick of assists in a 40 win against Reading, and he rounded the week off with a goal and an assist in a 2-0 win against Newcastle. Now, I was impressed, and I, along with everyone else with any interest in football, would remain very impressed for the next seven years. Technically, Eden Hazard is among the most gifted players in world football. He is one of very few players who seems to actually prefer receiving the ball when he is under immense pressure and surrounded by opposition players, as though he relishes the chance to dumbfound and wriggle free of them. Over the course of Hazard's seven seasons of English football, I would characterise him as having been extremely consistent, whilst having one off-season, along with most of the Chelsea squad it should be said, in 2015-16, and two particularly brilliant seasons, which both resulted in Chelsea winning the Premier League title. Hazard never played in a bad Chelsea team, but there were times when they majorly relied on him to provide them with moments of inspiration and to win games. And nine times out of ten, he would deliver. In total, Hazard scored 85 goals and made 61 assists, in 245 Premier League appearances, 
making the PFA Team of the Year four times and being named as Chelsea's Player of the Year four times as well. His position in second in this seven was rock solid as far as I was and still am concerned. First, Ryan Giggs. There have been lots of very good Premier League left-wingers. Some could even be described with that almost mystical and somewhat cryptic term, world-class. But as soon as the words quality and quantity of appearances in the Premier League era came out of my mouth, it ought to have been obvious that Ryan Giggs would top this seven, and that he would make my all-time Premier League eleven that is to come at the climax of this series. Ryan Giggs made 632 Premier League appearances, the second most of the Premier League era, over the course of 21 Premier League seasons, during which time he won a record-breaking 13 Premier League titles. That alone is near enough justification for his place in top spot, but I will embellish you nonetheless. In many respects, there were three stages of Ryan Giggs. The first stage was a fleet-footed wide man who broke through incredibly young, was fantastic on the ball, and scored a healthy dose of goals. The second was a slightly more conventional wide player, still quick, energetic and skillful, but also highly intelligent and increasingly a brilliant crosser of the ball. The final stage was a complete shift in Giggs's game once his pace had started to desert him and he moved inside to utilise all of his vision and experience to become a really top-class deep-line playmaker. I mean, there was also the stage where he had that eight-year affair with his brother's wife and was charged with bodily harm and common assault against two women and coercive and controlling behaviour, charges which Giggs denies, might I add, but that stage or those stages aren't relevant to his place at the top of this seven, so we will gloss over them just for now. Ultimately, regardless of the content of his character, Giggs was a fabulous footballer, and by far the greatest left winger of the Premier League era. The way in which he changed his game so subtly and successfully over time, his ability, consistency, and the sheer number of games that he played, along with the number of key contributions that he had during title-winning games and seasons, nobody else can compete. Arguably, in any position, but certainly not in this one. That is it for my seven, but before I leave you, which is the hardest part of every video, of course, there is still time to share with you my honourable mentions. I said at the beginning that there were two players that I had great difficulty with leaving out, and they were Alexis Sanchez and David Ginola. Sanchez was, for three and a half seasons, one of the best players in the Premier League, and in the 2016-17 season, he was probably the best player in the division outright. The problem is that, after those three and a half seasons, Sanchez joined Manchester United, where he was terrible, and I don't think that is even being too harsh to be honest, and ultimately, three and a half seasons, as good as they were, wasn't quite enough to earn him a spot ahead of either Sadio Mane or Hyung min Son. David Ginola, on his day, was just one of the most joyous and unplayable players that the Premier League has ever seen. He was 28 when he arrived in the Premier League, sticking around until his retirement after seven years, that were divided between stints at Newcastle, Tottenham, Aston Villa and Everton. Tall, handsome and endlessly talented, Ginola could sit a fullback down in his sleep and put a ball in the stanchion from 30 yards out as though it was second nature. Countless defenders described Ginola as their toughest opponent, and Johan Cruyff even called him the best player in the world in 1999, during his time at Tottenham. Unfortunately, Ginola could be rather inconsistent, he never came anywhere near to maximising his immense talent, and those two factors combined with him playing fewer than 200 Premier League games saw him just miss out to Mane and Son as well. Elsewhere, Honourable mentions go to Mark Overmars, John Barnes, Ian Robben, Paul Merson, Harry Kuehl, Samir Nasri, Lee Sharp, Stuart Downing, Ashley Young, Trevor Sinclair, Nick Barmby, Kevin Kilban, Louis Boamorte, Charles and Zogbia, Morton Gamst Pedersen, and Pierre Emmerich Abamyang, among many others, with the likes of Overmars, Barnes, and Robben missing out purely because they played so few games and spent so few seasons in the Premier League. Admittedly, only because, in the case of Barnes, he played his best football for Liverpool and Watford prior to the breakaway of the Premier League in 1992, it must be said. 7th. 
Eric Cantona. The early parts of this seven I found to be the most difficult to settle upon, but in the end, there was just no way that I could leave Eric Cantona out. The Frenchman didn't play an awful lot of Premier League football in the context of this seven, just 156 games over the course of five and a half seasons, and he didn't score all that many goals, again, compared to some of the other players in this seven, bagging 70 goals over the course of those 156 games in total. But Cantona's impact upon the Premier League and his influence upon the English game makes him one of the Premier League's greatest ever players regardless. Cantona first arrived in English football six months before the breakaway of the Premier League in January 1992 when he joined Leeds United from Nimes, initially only on loan for a fee of £100,000. It was £100,000 that would win Leeds United the first division title, thanks primarily to the partnership that Cantona forged alongside Lee Chapman. For all of his talent though, Cantona was often considered to be a troublemaker at Leeds, particularly after they signed him on a permanent basis in the summer of 1992. So just a few months later, when Manchester United came calling after their new signing Dion Dublin broke his leg, Leeds willingly accepted a bit of £1 million, the same amount that they had paid for him. Manchester United were a club on the rise under Alex Ferguson at the time, but they still hadn't won the league championship since 1967. The Red Devils had been down in 10th following a poor start to the campaign, winning only 5 of their opening 15 games. But Cantona came in and immediately lifted the mood. It is no secret that the Frenchman had a real aura about him, both on and off the pitch. And he also had a tremendous work ethic that he brought to training sessions. Cantona may not be the most prolific forward in this seven. Indeed, he often played almost as a number 10 but few Premier League players have scored as many truly crucial goals as him. Manchester United won four Premier League titles during Cantona's less than five seasons at the club, before he hung up his boots, aged only 30. It is impossible to say with any certainty whether Manchester United would still have become the dominant force in English football over the next couple of decades without Eric Cantona. But Alex Ferguson has gone on the record as saying that he believes there are no guarantees that they would have done, so Cantona quite rightly gets us started. Sixth, Dennis Bergkamp. The two least prolific strikers or centre forwards in this seven feature in sixth and seventh place in my seven as Dennis Bergkamp sneaks in narrowly ahead of Eric Cantona. Bergkamp spent a lot longer in the Premier League and played a little over twice as many games as the Frenchman, which is a large part of why he takes sixth. Signed by Arsenal from Inter Milan in 1995, upon his arrival in North London, Bergkamp reportedly became the highest paid player in the Premier League and he tripled what had been Arsenal's existing club record transfer fee. Following three outstanding seasons at Ajax, where he scored goals for fun, Bergkamp had bagged just four goals in all competitions in his last season in Milan. That didn't trouble Arsenal though, who saw Bergkamp as the perfect foil for Ian Wright. That proved to be a wise decision, and after Arsene Wenger arrived at Highbury in 1996, Bergkamp reached yet new heights. A year after Ian Wright left Arsenal, Thierry Henry arrived, and Bergkamp managed to form if anything, an even more impressive partnership with the Frenchman. Simply one of the most gifted players to have ever graced the Premier League, Bergkamp's touch, awareness, and his weight of pass elevated the English game, along with the rest of that brilliant Arsenal team. In total, Bergkamp scored 87 goals and made 94 assists in the Premier League over exactly 10 years in England. But beyond the numbers, he was just one of the most gifted and consequential overseas players that the Premier League has seen. Fifth, Harry Kane. The only current Premier League player in this seven, and I apologise if that is too much of a spoiler and you were expecting to see Cenk Tosin feature later on, it is quite possible that by the time Harry Kane hangs up his boots, or just bids farewell to the Premier League at least, he will have climbed another few places up this seven. As of 2022 though, I think fifth sits just right for the Tottenham man. Kane is already the fifth highest scorer of the Premier League era, so there is some pleasing symmetry with his ranking there, having recently overtaken both Frank Lampard and Thierry Henry. 
At this point, it seems inevitable that Kane will eventually become at least the second highest scorer of the Premier League era at some stage. It is just a question of whether he will ever leapfrog Alan Shearer into top spot. It is taken as a given that Kane has scored that many goals now, but it is no less remarkable. And nor is the fact that he will most likely become England's all-time record goalscorer before he turns 30. Unlike a lot of great Premier League strikers, whether that be Michael Owen or Ruud van Nistelrooy, it wasn't immediately obvious that Kane was destined for stardom the first time most of us saw him play. Between England's under-21s and various low moves, I must have watched Kane 20 times before he broke through at Tottenham due to a lack of forward options. And at no point during that time did I think that his eventual breakthrough seemed totally inevitable. Kane is not the quickest, nor is he the most naturally gifted. But he does have fantastic attacking movement, he can strike a ball cleanly and accurately with either foot, he's good in the air, and over the last few years, he has been as impressive as a provider of goals as he has been score of them. Above all else though, it is Kane's mentality that makes him so special as a player. He is relentless, whether that be in training, in terms of his self-belief, or just not letting the size of the occasion or any missed chances during a game go to his head. Unlike every other player in this seven, Kane has never won a Premier League title or any major trophy for that matter, but that doesn't stop him from being the fifth greatest striker of the Premier League era already, at the age of only 28, as far as I'm concerned. Fourth, Sergio Aguero. Sergio Aguero ranks one place ahead of Harry Kane in the Premier League era scoring charts, and he also ranks one place ahead of him in my seven. Aguero scored 184 goals in 275 Premier League games for Manchester City, which is an extraordinary record, especially given that he didn't play a full 90 minutes in a lot of those games. On a minutes per goal basis, Aguero is the single most prolific player of the Premier League era, and by some distance might I add, with Mohamed Salah recently having overtaken Thierry Henry as his closest competitor on that front. Aguero's start to life in the Premier League got off to a bang, as he scored a brace off the bench against what had been, up to that point, a resilient newly promoted Swansea City team, including a real thunderbolt from range. It was no secret that Aguero was a special talent from his time in Argentina and in Madrid, but if there were any doubts about his ability to transfer that form over to the Premier League, they were pretty quickly extinguished. Following Pep Guardiola's arrival at Manchester City, at which point there was a bit of speculation about Aguero's future at the club, the Argentine became much more physical, much more industrious, and far more involved in Man City's build-up play. At his best, which personally, I think, was probably the 2017-18 season, Aguero was an absolute animal. His strength, for someone who is only 5'8", was phenomenal, he could hold the ball up, bring others into the game, and he was still scoring almost a goal a game. Aguero seemed to pick up a niggling injury or two almost every season, which just prevented him from hitting truly ridiculous 30-plus league goal tallies a season, and perhaps from finishing even higher in this seven. But the fourth greatest striker of the Premier League era, off the back of nine seasons in England, well... It isn't bad going, is it? Third, Wayne Rooney. I think that there is a real debate to be had between Sergio Aguero and Wayne Rooney when it comes to the Premier League's greatest strikers, and it was one that I gave some real consideration. On the Aguero side of the argument, you have the fact that he was very much an out-and-out -out centre forward throughout all of his time in the Premier League. He was much more prolific than Rooney and much more consistent in terms of his overall output. On the other hand, Rooney played considerably more games in the Premier League, 216 more to be specific. He was more complete than Aguero, even Aguero in that 2017-18 season. And you could argue that the only reason Rooney wasn't as prolific as the Argentine, and arguably the only reason he didn't score even more goals in the Premier League than Alan Shearer, is because he was always either drawn or instructed to come deep, drift out wide, and get involved with the game at all times rather than just scoring goals. It gets forgotten now, but even though Wayne Rooney is a year younger than Cristiano Ronaldo, back in 2004, when Rooney linked up with Ronaldo at Manchester United, he was way ahead of Ronaldo in terms of his talent and contribution. 
The way that Wayne Rooney performed at Euro 2004 as an 18-year-old was absolutely mind-blowing. And had certain external factors been different, I think Rooney could comfortably have gone down in the same bracket as Messi and Ronaldo. Whilst he did not manage that, he still had an extraordinary career. In the Premier League alone, Rooney scored 208 goals and made 103 assists in 491 appearances. At his most prolific, in the 2009-10 season, Rooney scored 26 goals in 32 Premier League games. But he was never content with just being a number 9. Rooney's decline, if you like, had already begun by the time he was 28 and he left the Premier League at 32 in a move to the MLS. Had he maintained his pre-2014 level into his mid-30s, Rooney might have trouble top spot. But given how early he broke through, he has still done more than enough to merit a bronze medal in this seven. Second, Alan Shearer. Realistically, even if it was just based solely upon the number of goals that he scored, Alan Shearer could only finish either second or first in this seven. Shearer is of course the highest goal scorer of the Premier League era on 260 goals and he ranks fifth in English football's all-time top flight scoring charts with 283 goals. That is because 23 of Shearer's top flight goals, all of which were scored at Southampton, came before the creation of the Premier League in 1992. It was in 1992 that Shearer left Southampton, joining free-spending Blackburn Rovers under the ownership of Jack Walker and the management of Kenny Dalglish. It was at Blackburn that Shearer won his only Premier League title in 1995, during his most prolific, and indeed one of the Premier League's most prolific campaigns, as the Englishman bagged 34 goals in 42 Premier League games. In 1996, when Shearer was probably at the peak of his powers, he had the choice of joining Manchester United or Newcastle United. From a footballing perspective, Manchester United were the obvious choice as the emerging force within the English game. But Shearer was a Newcastle fan, so he decided to join his boyhood club for a world record £15 million. Over the next nine years, Shearer became Newcastle's leading peacetime goalscorer, bagging 206 goals in 405 games. Often described as an old-school British centre-forward, given his strength, aerial ability, and his willingness to put his head in where it hurts, do not be fooled into thinking that Shearer couldn't play a bit as well. Brilliant at holding the ball up and bringing others into the game, it was his ability to score every type of goal, left foot, right foot, bullet headers, scruffy finishes, tap-ins, screamers, free kicks and penalties, you name it, Shearer could put it in the back of the net. And only the unique va va -voom of the man up next can restrict the Premier League's greatest goalscorer to a spot in second. First, Peter Crouch. Not just the tallest, but also the best, Peter Crouch is the leading scorer of Hedig... Nah, I'm just messing with you. First, Thierry Henry. I might have given it away a bit with that va va -voom reference there. For those of you who remember that advert and aren't just wondering why Alfie is quoting from a Nicki Minaj song whilst talking about Alan Shearer, but I suspect that even without any spoilers, once I named Alan Shearer in second, most of you knew who was going to take gold. For my money, narrowly ahead of Roy Keane, Thierry Henry, is not just the greatest forward of the Premier League era, but also the greatest player in any position. Henry was brought to the Premier League in 1999 by Arsene Wenger, who had worked with a teenage Henri at Monaco. He joined Arsenal off the back of just seven months at Juventus, where Henri had struggled to get to grips with life in Syria, only managing to score three goals in 20 outings, and even being deputised as a left wing-back. Henri had always been a left winger, in fairness, for both Monaco and France, but it was at Arsenal that Arsene Wenger made him the Gunners' central striker. Henri would always drift out left for Arsenal, to particularly devastating effect once his compatriot Robert Pires joined the club, but his move central proved to be a masterstroke. In his debut campaign, Henri scored 17 goals in the Premier League and 26 in all competitions. In the 2002-03 season, Henri not only scored 24 Premier League goals, he also made a record-breaking 20 league assists from 37 outings, the latter of which has since been matched once by Kevin De Bruyne, but never exceeded. The following season, Henri, in what is widely regarded as having been his magnum opus, scored 30 goals in the league alone, as Arsenal went invincible in the Premier League. In total, Henri scored 175 goals 
and made 74 assists in 258 Premier League games, winning the Golden Boot four times, making the Premier League Team of the Season six times, and making the PFA Team of the Century. Beyond the numbers though, Henri was also just the most feared and iconic player that the Premier League has ever seen when he was at his absolute best. For the best part of a decade, when Premier League defenders went to sleep at night, they had nightmares where all they saw were those long sleeves and gloves. When you saw that iconic combination, it was pretty much game over before a ball had even been kicked. Henri was lightning quick, incredibly skillful, and effortlessly inventive in terms of both his dribbling, passing, and finishing. His backheel goal for Arsenal against Charlton Athletic, whilst far from being his most impressive goal for the club, was indicative of that invention and confidence that he had in his own game. There are lots of different ways that I could justify on re-topping this seven, but ultimately, I just think that he is the greatest centre-forward of the Premier League era. So those are my top seven, but I promised you some brief explanations and honourable mentions, and we start with Luis Suarez. At his peak, Suarez was as good as anyone in this seven. I would argue, even Henri. And if I were ranking the best Premier League strikers, or the best seasons by Premier League strikers, he would take either first or second place. Ultimately though, as I alluded to in the introduction, Suarez simply played too few games, spent too few seasons, and by virtue of that, just lacked the weight of Premier League greatness to feature ahead of either Dennis Bergkamp or Eric Cantona. The striker who actually came closest to making my 7, based on the stated criteria of quality and quantity of performances in the Premier League that we have used throughout this series, was Andy Cole. And I was really disappointed that I couldn't find a place for him because I don't think that he gets anywhere near the credit that he deserves when people talk about all-time Premier League greats. And now I feel like I am part of the problem. Were this channel called HITC8, he would definitely have featured. Behind Andy Cole, if I were to make a top 10, it would be Liverpool duo Robbie Fowler and Michael Owen who would complete that list. Both were teenage superstars who shot to immediate stardom, Fowler arguably the finest finisher that the Premier League has ever seen, and Owen basically brilliant at everything before he suffered the first of many hamstring injuries at the age of only 19. Were it not for that first injury, and all those that followed, Owen could well have been as good as anyone in this seven. And the fact that he still achieved what he did in the Premier League, despite being plagued by injuries and spending time at Real Madrid, meant that he very nearly featured. Elsewhere, honourable mentions are owed to Ruud van Nisseroy, Robin van Persie, Carlos Tevez, Dimitar Berbatov, Ian Wright, Teddy Sheringham, Jamie Vardy, Dwight York, Nicholas Enelka, Fernando Torres, Jermaine Defoe, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank, Mark Viduka, Emil Heskey, Robbie Keane, Kevin Phillips, Romelu Lukaku, Peter Crouch, Dion Dublin, Darren Bent, Yakubu, and Didier Drogba, among others. And not in that order, of course. Drogba, again, was as unplayable, if not even more so, than anyone in my seven when he was at his dominant best. But he only had two truly rip-roaring Premier League seasons, and whilst his big game credentials are undeniable, all those sensational final performances are irrelevant to this seven, which is concerned only with the Premier League. Seventh, Claudio Ranieri. A man who illustrates, quite possibly better than anyone else, the difficulties in formulating a seven of this silk, it would be fair to say that Claudio Ranieri has had his ups and downs in the Premier League. In four seasons at Chelsea, Ranieri finished sixth, sixth, fourth, and finally second, following a summer in which he was backed by Roman Abramovich's billions, before he was replaced by Jose Mourinho. At Leicester City, more than a decade later, Ranieri won the league in his debut campaign in what is by far the greatest upset and achievement any manager has accomplished during the Premier League era, before getting sacked just the following season with the Foxes threatened with relegation. And most recently, Ranieri has had two very short-lived stints at Fulham and Watford where he had a win percentage of less than 20%. As you can see then, when you look at Ranieri's Premier League career as a whole, there are lots of factors that you have to weigh up, and he would do well to crack even the top 20 were it not for his remarkable title win at Leicester in 2016. However, 
he did win the Premier League title, Leicester did do the unthinkable, and no manager in this seven can put their name, or even hold a candle, to a more remarkable achievement than that. What's more, it is worth remembering the context in which Ranieri was appointed at the King Power Stadium. Leicester had pulled off a great escape under Nigel Pearson the previous season, who was sacked in acrimonious circumstances over the summer, allegedly linked to his son James's role in a racist sex tape that was filmed during the Foxes' pre-season tour of Thailand. Ranieri's appointment was not a particularly popular one, and was treated with great scepticism by a lot of people, including myself. Ranieri had just been sacked after only four games in charge of the Greece national team, which concluded with a defeat against the Faroe Islands. Leicester were, unsurprisingly then, among the favourites to be relegated once again, but Ranieri was able to implement an exhilarating and remarkably effective brand of counter-attacking football, he created a tremendous dressing room environment, and he brought out the best in every single player in that squad. It cannot have been easy keeping those players, most of whom had zero experience in that type of scenario, level-headed and on top of their game whilst they went on such an inconceivable run. But Ranieri did it, and that achievement alone, aided a little bit by four decent years at Chelsea, is enough to merit him squeaking in. Sixth, David Moyes. The juxtaposition between Claudio Ranieri and David Moyes is an emphatic one, the latter of whom has never won a Premier League title, or come particularly close to doing so, despite predominantly having managed teams who were perceived as having greater title prospects, albeit still pretty limited, than Leicester City. Nonetheless, whilst Moyes' trophy cabinet may look a little scarce, I still think that you can count the number of greater Premier League managers than him on a single hand. Alex Ferguson and Arsene Wenger are the only managers to have won more games during the Premier League era than Moyes, and Ferguson, Wenger and Harry Redknapp are the only managers to have taken charge of a team in more Premier League fixtures. The vast majority of Moyes' Premier League management to date came during his more than 11 years at Everton, where he did an outstanding job. Moyes inherited an Everton team that was mired in a relegation scrap, off the back of four very successful seasons at Preston North End, and he was able to guide them to safety. Moyes managed to transform Everton into the best of the rest for much of his time at Goodison Park, and even cracked the top four at a time when many said that it couldn't be done. He did all of that on a shoestring budget, as Everton spent less than the likes of Birmingham City, Middlesbrough, and Bolton Wanderers during his time at the club. Everyone knows about Moyes' subsequent short-lived stint at Manchester United, but replacing Alex Ferguson was in many ways an impossible job, as was the Sunderland job that Moyes took on in 2016, albeit for rather different reasons. Ultimately though, whilst his lack of trophies and the fact that the jury is still out as to whether he can do it at the very highest level had to restrict him to a spot in sixth, Moyes is probably the greatest mid-table manager of the Premier League era, and he is proving his talents yet again at West Ham, who he has also taken from relegation concerns to European football and even the semi-finals of the UEFA Europa League. Probably shouldn't have volleyed a ball at a ball boy though, and then used the fact that it sat up nicely for him to hit as an excuse. You know, with the benefit of hindsight. I'm sure it seemed like a great idea at the time. Fifth, Jurgen Klopp. Time and trophies are the only things that count against Jurgen Klopp, in a Premier League context, who has undoubtedly done one of the finest jobs in the history of the Premier League, if not all of English football, at Liverpool to date. Whilst Klopp is not solely responsible for Liverpool's turnaround on his watch, no manager acts in isolation, and all are dependent on external factors to some extent, it is tough to imagine that any other manager in all of world football, would have been capable of orchestrating such a meteoric rise. Although Liverpool had finished second in the 2013-14 campaign, just two seasons before Klopp arrived, so much of that success was down to Luis Suarez alone, who had since departed, and Liverpool didn't look anything like a title-winning team by October 2015. Klopp's first starting eleven at Liverpool included the likes of Simon Mignolet, Mamadou Sacco, and Alberto Moreno. Since Klopp arrived, almost seven years ago, Liverpool's recruitment has arguably been the best in world football, 
but the way in which Klopp has nurtured those players and created a system in which they have flourished has been pretty spectacular. I have said numerous times before on this channel that even when Liverpool have missed out on the title to Manchester City, I don't think that they have got enough credit for driving perhaps the greatest and almost certainly the most efficient Premier League team of all time quite so close. Klopp has the third highest win percentage of any manager during the Premier League era and this season he and Liverpool have the potential to do something unprecedented in the entire history of English football. On sheer managerial ability, I think you would probably be able to make a compelling case for Klopp coming even higher than fifth. But the fact that he has only won one Premier League title at the time of recording, potentially two by the end of this season, and his achievements at Liverpool outside of the Premier League sadly aren't relevant to this seven, restricts him to a spot in fifth. Just for now. Fourth, Jose Mourinho. One place behind Jurgen Klopp in terms of the Premier League's all-time managerial rankings based solely on win percentage, but one place ahead of him in this seven, Jose Mourinho is one of only five managers to have won more than 200 games during the Premier League era. Brought to the Premier League as Claudio Ranieri's replacement at Chelsea in 2004, Mourinho's first stint with the Blues was fairly remarkable even with by far the deepest pockets of any team in the division, to win back-to-back -back Premier League titles, and indeed back-to-back -back League and Cup doubles, in your first two seasons in charge, at a club that hadn't won a top-flight league title since 1955, well, I guess you could describe that as being pretty special. I can remember it being fairly shocking at the time, but it seems even more outrageous now that after winning six trophies in only three seasons, including two Premier League titles, Jose Mourinho was sacked, or forced to leave by mutual consent, and replaced by Avram Grant following a one-all draw with Rosenborg in the Champions League. Mourinho later returned to Chelsea, where he won a third Premier League title, before a horrific title defence saw him sacked once again. That bruising experience seemed to change Mourinho a little, and I have made a whole video about how it seemed to have impacted and changed him not that long ago. Should you be interested? It should be said that he took Manchester United to their highest league finish since Sir Alex Ferguson's retirement as Premier League runners-up, an achievement that was matched by Ole Gunnar Solskjaer last season, but is yet to be exceeded. Mourinho also won the Europa League at Old Trafford, but as with Klopp, his European exploits aren't relevant to this seven. Mourinho's last job in the Premier League at Tottenham Hotspur was his least successful, and it marked the first time since taking over at Porto in 2002 that Mourinho had left a club without winning a single trophy. His win percentage at Tottenham was lower than Maurizio Pochettino's and Antonio Conte's, and only narrowly better than Nuno Espirito Santos. But in spite of that undoubted drop-off, Mourinho's overall legacy and the work that he has done in the Premier League means that he is unfortunate, in my opinion, not to make a podium finish. Third, Pep Guardiola. The biggest blight on Pep Guardiola's record at Manchester City, if you can call it that, has been his inability to guide the club to their first Champions League crown. However, this seven is concerned solely with the Premier League, and in the Premier League, Guardiola's record is practically flawless. No manager has a better win percentage than Guardiola during the Premier League era, and it isn't even close. Pep's 74% win percentage at the Etihad is not just by far and away the highest win percentage of any manager in the Premier League, it's actually even better than Pep's own win percentage at FC Barcelona. It might surprise you to discover. I know it surprised me. And it is almost neck and neck with his record at Bayern Munich. There will be those who say, well, yes, he has had lots of money to spend and he inherited some very good players. And that is undoubtedly true. But it's worth remembering that wasn't the narrative when Guardiola first arrived. Man City had finished fourth the season before Pep arrived, 15 points behind title winners Leicester City and tied on points with Manchester United in fifth. There was rather a large consensus spanning from pundits to fans, particularly after Man City finished third in Guardiola's debut campaign and Conte's Chelsea romped to the league title miles ahead of them, that he wouldn't be able to replicate the way in which he played in La Liga and in the Bundesliga in the Premier League. It just wouldn't work. Well, 
Guardiola refused to compromise, and the results have been emphatic. He is the only manager ever to win 100 points in a single Premier League season, and he followed that up with 98 points the following season. Guardiola has changed the way that football is played in England, and in five seasons, he has won as many Premier League titles as Jose Mourinho won in nine and a half seasons, and as many as Arsene Wenger won in 22. It is quite possible that Guardiola could make that four titles in only six seasons this season, which would put him second only to Alex Ferguson during the Premier League era. So, he starts the countdown of my top three. Second, Arsene Wenger. I should imagine that there won't be too many surprises about my top two, but I will justify them nonetheless, along with a quick word for those managers who just missed out. As I said, Pep Guardiola has won as many Premier League titles as Arsene Wenger in less than a quarter of the time, and he could have won more than Wenger ever did by the time that this season has concluded. However, context is important, longevity is important, and greatness is about more than trophies alone. Arsene Wenger inherited an Arsenal team that had finished 5th, 12th, 4th, and 10th in the four seasons before he arrived, and his appointment caught a lot of people off guard. Brought in from Nagoya Grampus 8 in Japan, Arsene Hu was the headline in the Evening Standard on the day that the Frenchman was appointed. But Wenger took a team that was built on strong foundations with a very solid backline and turned it into one of the most free-flowing and entertaining teams that the Premier League has ever seen, whilst retaining those strong foundations and an excellent work ethic. Arsenal's signings in Wenger's first five seasons at the club, from Robert Pires to Thierry Henry, were absolutely out of this world. And for eight seasons, between 1997-98 and 2004-05, Arsenal never finished lower than second. Unfortunately for them, and for Arsene Wenger, the brilliance of Manchester United and later Chelsea meant that they only, with only in inverted commas there, won three Premier League titles during that time. Wenger shaped the future of English football more so than any other manager during the Premier League era, including Alex Ferguson. His recruitment, training, and dietary methods modernised the league like you wouldn't believe, dragging it into the 21st century, as the drinking culture that still hung around from the First Division era was largely wiped out, and a new breed of artist and athlete was born. Even in Wenger's later years, when Arsenal struggled to compete for league titles, it must be remembered that the Gunners were spending just a fraction of what those around them were spending. Yet, only in Wenger's last two seasons did Arsenal actually slip out of the Champions League places. Wenger holds the record for the most games managed in the Premier League, 828, and the second most wins, 476. But above all else, it was the way in which he moulded the league, having arrived as an unknown quantity, and knocked a dominant Manchester United team off their perch, that ensured that Wenger took second place in my seven. First, Tim Sherwood. Yeah, I bet you weren't expecting that, were you? Tim Sherwood is a man who finished 17th at Aston Villa and reached an FA Cup final. And after they sacked him, that's right, they were relegated in dead last. A lesson for life, don't doubt Big Tim. The man works miracles. Nah, I'm just kidding. He's rubbish. He is a terrible manager. This was just another one of my many brilliant pranks. First, Alex Ferguson. As predictable as Mexico going out in the round of 16 of the FIFA World Cup, or Ricky Gervais not being able to write a good sitcom without Stephen Merchant, obviously, the greatest manager of the Premier League era is Sir Alex Ferguson. In 21 years of management in the Premier League, Fergie won 13 league titles, that is more than Pep Guardiola, Arsene Wenger, Jose Mourinho, Antonio Conte, and Claudio Ranieri combined. I could probably leave it at just that in terms of justifying Ferguson's position in top spot, which I doubt any right-minded person would dispute. But I will embellish you just a little, just for the fun of it. Ferguson took charge at Manchester United when the club was second bottom in the first division in November 1986, having finished fourth in the previous season. The Red Devils hadn't won a top flight league title since the 1960s, and in Ferguson's first season, they finished 11th. It wouldn't be until Ferguson's seventh season at Old Trafford, which 
just so happened, to be the inaugural Premier League campaign, that he and Manchester United would finally be crowned as champions of England. I think that it is worth pointing out that in the 1988-89 and 1989-90 seasons, fresh off the back of finishing second in the first division, Manchester United slipped to 11th and 13th. How many modern managers would survive that at a club like Manchester United? Well, Alex Ferguson did, they were different times, and when the Premier League was born, Manchester United dominated the breakaway division. The most impressive thing about Ferguson, in my view, was his ability to overhaul a squad whilst remaining competitive, and to win league titles with teams built around three or four different cores during his time at Old Trafford. From that of Bruce, Pallister, Ince, Hughes and Co, to the treble winning team of York, Cole and the class of 92 cohort, and arguably his best ever team with that phenomenal front three of Ronaldo, Rooney and Tevez. Ferguson was able to make average players look very good, very good players look great, and kept the already great players level-headed. And as soon as he felt that they weren't level-headed, he got rid of them. All things considered, this is just a long way of saying, obviously, Alex Ferguson is the greatest manager of the Premier League era. And either Jurgen Klopp or Pep Guardiola would probably need another decade at Liverpool and Man City if they were going to attempt to change that. In terms of my 26-man shortlist for this video, the 19 managers who made that list but missed out on my final seven contained five Premier League winning managers in Kenny Dalglish, Antonio Conte, Manuel Pellegrini, Roberto Mancini, and Carlo Ancelotti, alongside Rafa Benitez, Harry Redknapp, Sam Allardyce, Maurizio Pochettino, Kevin Keegan, Martin O'Neill, Brendan Rodgers, Bobby Robson, Gerard Houllier, Roy Hodgson, Ron Atkinson, Alan Kerbishley, Sean Dyche, and Steve McLaren. I think there could be a couple of others, Roy Evans springs to mind, who may be unfortunate to miss out on that shortlist as well. And of those named, I think Kenny Dalgleish, Roy Hodgson, and quite possibly Sam Allardyce would have to complete my top 10. The eternal debate when constructing one of these 11s is whether you pick the greatest players in each position and just throw them all together, or whether you pick what you think would actually be the most balanced and formidable starting 11 in real life. Or, in some cases, a compromise between the two. What I have done, because I like to go above and beyond for all of you lovely people, is both. So the first 11 that I will go through is my Premier League era greatest 11, based on who topped each of the positional sevens, which, as you may recall if you watched any or all of them, was based on the quality and quantity of each player's performances in the Premier League. My second 11 is what I actually think would be the most formidable and unbeatable 11 that you could possibly assemble, made up only of Premier League legends, which... I personally think is genius, so stay tuned for that. And then right at the end, I am going to share my pre-Premier League era English football greatest 11 very quickly because football in England did actually exist before the Premier League for quite some time and those stars of yesteryear deserve some love as well. I know, I know, I spoil you rotten, but you are worth it. Well, most of you anyway. Since there are three 11s to get through rather than one, I'm not going to go player by player as I normally would, since we would be here all week. Instead, I'll just go position by position, so my keeper, my defenders, midfielders, you get the idea. It will be absolutely brilliant, I promise. Without further ado then, and apologies if I sound a bit like death, but just thank your lucky stars if you are one of those people who are fortunate enough not to suffer from hay fever, here is my greatest 11 of the Premier League era, starting with the 11 that is based upon simply the greatest Premier League players in each position. Goalkeeper, Peter Schmeichel. Pretty straightforward this one. Peter Schmeichel topped my goalkeeper's seven, narrowly ahead of Petr Cech, so it is the Great Dane who starts between the sticks in our first 11. At his peak, Schmeichel was probably worth 10 points a season to Manchester United, even compared to if they had someone who was solid but not spectacular in net. 
throughout his eight years at Manchester United, and to a lesser extent, his two seasons with Man City and Aston Villa, Schmeichel had a presence about him that no other Premier League goalkeeper has been able to replicate either before or since, in terms of the confidence that he inspired in his back line, and the fear that he struck into the hearts of opposing forwards. Right, that is enough babble from me on that one. Back four, from right to left, reads Gary Neville, Rio Ferdinand, John Terry, and Ashley Cole. Again, I am going to be brief with this one because I don't think that there are any great surprises based upon the criteria that was used to formulate this 11. In terms of the quality and quantity of their performances in the Premier League, Gary Neville is head and shoulders above any other right back, Rio Ferdinand and John Terry are in a league of their own among centre-backs, and I don't think anyone can really rival Ashley Cole at left-back. Dennis Irwin in relation to Ashley Cole is probably the closest competitor that any of these four had, based upon this criteria. Sol Campbell wasn't a million miles off Ferdinand and Terry, and Tony Adams would have been a strong candidate had half of his career not come before the breakaway of the Premier League from the first division. Ultimately, though, I think that these four pretty much pick themselves. The midfield, again, from right to left, reads Mohamed Salah, Roy Keane, Paul Scholes, and Ryan Giggs. Much more contentious than the back four, I would suggest. There is stern competition for every one of the four midfield spots, with the possible exception of the left flank, where I think it would be quite difficult to argue that anyone comes close to Ryan Giggs on the left wing in terms of the quality and quantity of their performances in the Premier League. If you want to understand why Salah starts ahead of Cristiano Ronaldo, Roy Keane ahead of Patrick Vieira, and Paul Scholes ahead of both Steven Gerrard and Frank Lampard, feel free to go back and watch those positional sevens if you haven't already, because if I tried to explain it here, this video would be extremely long. But as I say, those three were all much tighter calls. It's interesting to note that three of this four-man midfield were actually teammates playing together in the same midfield for about 11 years. Perhaps it should come as little surprise then that Manchester United won six Premier League titles during those 11 seasons and never finished lower than third, especially since David Beckham was also part of that midfield for the majority of that time. Mohamed Salah would obviously be a little bit out of his comfort zone playing on the right of a midfield four rather than on the right of a front three. Hence why I think my own 11 that we are about to come to is better than this one, but it still doesn't look too bad, does it? And finally, for this 11, up top, it is a combination of Thierry Henry and Alan Shearer. The Premier League has been blessed with some outstanding centre-forwards, whether that be the elegance of Dennis Bergkamp, the speed of Michael Owen, or the genius of Eric Cantona. But I think there are four, in terms of the quality and quantity of their performances in the division, who stand out above all the rest. And they are Sergio Aguero, Wayne Rooney, Thierry Henry, and Alan Shearer. You can probably just about take your pick out of those four, in terms of how you would rank them from first to fourth. But... Those of you who watch the specific centre forward seven will know that I went with Shearer and Henri as my top two, hence why they are the straight partnership in this 11. Completely different players, Henri joined Arsenal having played as a left wing back for a while at Juventus, and he continued to drift out onto the left flank at Arsenal, combining with Ashley Cole, Robert Perez, and Dennis Bergkamp to devastating effect. Lightning quick, Fantastic on the ball, and capable of scoring a myriad of different goals, Henri is, to my mind at least, the greatest player of the Premier League era. Shearer was a very different type of forward, always an out-and-out -out centre forward, and not as obviously insanely gifted at first glance. His finishing and movement during his time at Blackburn were probably the best that the league has ever seen, and at Newcastle, he became a much more well-rounded and complete centre forward, capable of holding the ball up, scoring goals, and bringing others into the game, as well as just about anyone else. I have absolutely no idea how the two of them would combine in a strike partnership, but that is not something that I have to worry about with this 11. That's for the next one. 
the rest of the 23-man squad using the same system of those previous positional videos, including the utility one, Reeds, Petr Cech, Edwin van der Sar, Cal Walker, Sol Campbell, Dennis Irwin, Patrick Vieira, Frank Lampard, Steven Gerrard, James Milner, Eden Hazard, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Wayne Rooney. Admittedly, James Milner does look a little bit out of place there, but he topped the utility players 7, hence why he had to make the squad, and he would be a very useful player to have around, even in a squad as gifted as that one. Alright, now for what I think would actually be the most formidable 11 of the Premier League era, with the shackles taken off. The only restriction that I put on myself with regards to this 11 is that I could only pick from the players who at least featured in the series up to this point, so they had to be at least one of the seven greatest players of the Premier League era in their respective positions. Meaning that, whilst I could pick them at the peak of their powers, that would ensure that they were all still Premier League legends. I hope that I'm not confusing anyone too much here. It all seems relatively straightforward to me, but I'm acutely aware that that could possibly be because it is me talking and I know what I mean. Basically, if I was building a Premier League era 11 and 23-man squad to play a single game of football or a whole season, and I would die if they didn't either win that game or the league title, this is the 11 and squad that I would pick. Goalkeeper, Edwin van der Sar. I know, I know. I have overlooked both Schmeichel and Czech in net because Edwin van der Sar wasn't just a brilliant goalkeeper, he made virtually no obvious mistakes, he was also a top-class professional, one of the calmest keepers in the business, and his distribution was outstanding. He was far better with the ball at his feet than either Schmeichel or Czech, and since I needed a keeper who could play a bit, you know, playing it out from the back, he is my choice, and I'm pretty happy with it. You might not be, but hopefully, if you are not, it will make a little bit more sense when you see the rest of my team. The back four reads Carl Walker, Rio Ferdinand, Virgil van Dijk, and Ashley Cole. Alright, this one might boil some piss. I suspect, depending upon your club allegiances, and even if you are just a neutral, there will be two big question marks about this one. The first one, I suspect, is where the hell is John Terry? And the second one, I would imagine, is what is Carl Walker doing at right back? I will start with JT who made the initial 11 and is, as I said, either the greatest or second greatest centre-back of the Premier League era. Now, that isn't the criteria for this 11, however, which is just a case of building the best team. And I am strongly of the opinion that Rio Ferdinand is the greatest centre-back to have ever graced the Premier League. I think some people's perceptions are slightly distorted by the fact that Terry was probably a little bit better in his last few years in the Premier League before dropping down into the Championship with Aston Villa than Ferdinand was in his last injury-disrupted season at Manchester United, the season after Sir Alex Ferguson retired, and certainly in his regrettable final season in football with Queen's Park Rangers. However, that is just a snapshot of the last few years of their careers. When he first broke through at West Ham, then at Leeds United, and eventually at Manchester United following two record-breaking transfers, Rio Ferdinand was the outstanding centre-back in all of English football. Big, strong, quick, positionally excellent, brilliant on the ball, accurate in the pass, I really could go on. There was virtually nothing that Rio Ferdinand couldn't do as a centre-back, and given that his spot in my 11 was never up for debate, it was just a question of who would be the best player to partner him at centre-back, in my 11. Virgil van Dijk only just snuck into my greatest centre-backs of the Premier League era 7 in 7th place by virtue of the fact that he hasn't played in the Premier League or at the highest level for nearly as long as a lot of other candidates. Nonetheless, he is a really special centre-back. His physical attributes combined with his defensive fundamentals are superb, and whilst I don't think his passing or technique are as good as Rio's were, they are still excellent by centre-back standards. Together, I just think these two would be absolutely rock-solid defensively and a brilliant foundation in terms of starting attacks. As for Carl Walker, I was always of the opinion that he was slightly overrated, and that 
Whilst brilliant on his day, he always had a mistake in him, especially against top-class opposition, and on the biggest occasions, relying far too much on that really incredible pace, so much so that when it couldn't bail him out, he would end up doing something a bit stupid. I still think that that is an accurate description of Walker during his time at Tottenham, and I have no doubt that he still has that moment of rashness in his locker. But for the last three seasons at Manchester City, he has very rarely revealed it. Walker is still lightning quick, he is brilliant in one-on-one -on -one situations, and his positioning has come on leaps and bounds. He is the only fullback who I've seen Kylian Mbappe lack the belief to run at and try and take on, and I don't think that the Frenchman is alone in that respect. So Walker is my right back, on the basis that it is the Kyle Walker of the last two to three years at Manchester City, and not the younger, more hot-headed version of him. My three-man midfield is made up of Patrick Vieira, Fernandinho, and Kevin De Bruyne. I think there is very little to split Roy Keane and Patrick Vieira, who are the two greatest midfielders of the Premier League era, at least as far as I'm concerned, and I would have zero complaints about swapping the Frenchman for Keane in this 11. I picked Vieira purely because of his ball-carrying abilities that were better than Keane's. Meanwhile, both had incredible energy and presence about them, in addition to their obvious leadership skills, their ability to win the ball back, and their willingness to be direct and to drive the team forward in possession. There are a handful of greater Premier League midfielders than Fernandinho. I could have played both Keane and Vieira if I liked for a start, and I did feel torn about including him for that reason. I've no doubt that it will be an unpopular decision among those of you in the comments, as it was with me in a sense. So I get that. But ultimately, I just couldn't escape the fact that I think this team needed a proper destructive defensive midfielder rather than two box-to-box -box players like Keane and Vieira, and there wasn't anyone who I could put in that role who I felt more confident or more relaxed about when I looked to my eleven as a whole than Fernandinho at his best. I am playing down his talents a little, simply because of the calibre of player that I have left out to include him, but I do think that Fernandinho was Manchester City's most important player in the 2017-18 season, and arguably the league's best player during a campaign in which he was relentless out of possession and practically faultless when he had the ball. So the Brazilian features because I think that he just makes us a better team than anyone else, which is the same reason why every player features, but I felt the need to explain that one a little bit more because he wasn't someone who I expected to pick when I first sat down to draft my team. Kevin De Bruyne, I think, picks himself. He is the most talented midfielder to have played in the Premier League, and by the time he leaves Manchester City, he will most likely make the first 11 in this video, as well as the second one. The three players up next would have a field day with him playing in behind them, and those three players are Thierry Henry, Alan Shearer, and Cristiano Ronaldo. Nah, come on. If that's not a frightening forward line, I really don't know what is. Cristiano Ronaldo, given that this is his peak in the Premier League that we are talking about, would be making constant runs inside. He has got Patrick Vieira and Fernandinho in midfield, meaning that he would have very limited defensive responsibilities, which is just the way that he likes it, and Cal Walker marauding down that right flank on occasion to offer additional width. The deliveries of Ashley Cole and Kevin De Bruyne into the box from the right and left flanks respectively would be a dream for both Shearer and Ronaldo. Meanwhile, Henri is obviously reunited with Ashley Cole on the left flank and would also be making constant runs between the opposing right back and centre back with his compatriot and former teammate Patrick Vieira providing for him in addition to Kevin De Bruyne. No, I don't take these fancy 11s too seriously at all. I don't know what you're talking about. In between Henri and Ronaldo, you have got Alan Shearer. And we are talking about 1995 or 1996 Alan Shearer here, who would score 50-plus goals in this team. Of that, I have no doubt. And at least 40 in the Premier League alone. Heck, he scored 34 in a season in the Premier League at Blackburn. Maybe I'm being too conservative, even with that prediction. But either way, I suspect that this team as a whole would breeze past Manchester City's record of scoring 106 goals in a Premier League season, which they set during the 2017-18 campaign. Just imagine 
the pace, power and precision of this team on the counter-attack, with Kyle Walker and Ashley Cole flying up the pitch from fullback as Fernandinho slots in alongside the two centre-backs, Van der Sar, Van Dijk and Ferdinand, all capable of playing pinpoint long balls out wide to either flank or into the feet of Vieira and De Bruyne, Vieira marauding forward with those long legs of his, De Bruyne creating, Henri and Ronaldo probably among the fastest players the division has ever seen, and even Shearer could really shift back in his Blackburn days. Frightening. I think that it would be a great game, but I'm pretty sure my second 11 beats my first 11 probably 7 or 8 times out of 10, which makes sense I guess given that the first one is just a mishmash of the greatest players of the Premier League era in each position, based upon the criteria that I have used throughout this series. Meanwhile, the second one was designed with the express intention of winning games and league titles. To that end, the rest of the 23-man squad for the second group includes Peter Schmeichel, Petr Cech, Trent Alexander-Arnold, John Terry, Ricardo Carvalho, Dennis Irwin, Roy Keane, Paul Scholes, Yaya Torre, Mohamed Salah, Gareth Bale, and Wayne Rooney. I would explain why, but I suspect that you are all sick of my voice, especially played by hay fever by this stage, and there is still the small matter of my pre-1992 English Football Greatest Eleven, which looks like this. In goal, I have gone for Gordon Banks, narrowly ahead of the likes of Bert Troutman, Pat Jennings, Frank Swift, and Neville Southall. My back four, from right to left, is Roger Byrne, Neil Franklin, Bobby Moore, and Eddie Hapgood, with Graham Sooner sitting in midfield, Bobby Charlton ahead of him, Stanley Matthews on the right flank, Tom Finney out wide on the left, George Best playing in a free roll behind the centre forward, and Jimmy Greaves up front, with... Roughly 400 honourable mentions, not least John Charles, who only misses out because he went to Juventus and only actually spent one season in English football's top flight. So that is it for today's video. Subscribers and regular viewers will know that this was a collection, if you like, of the previous videos within this series, partly so that they could all be watched in one place, and because my only previous compilation video taking a look uh, the best footballer from every country on earth is currently my most viewed video that I've ever made, and also partly because I am taking a scandalously rare break from work with five days off next week, so it seemed like a good idea to get an extra video up. Anyhow, I hope that you all enjoyed it, whether it was new to you or not. I hope that you all have a magnificent day, week, month, year and decade, and I hope that you never go in too hard for a header in football tennis, do a full flip, land face first on a hard court, and come out of it with concussion and a chipped tooth. I can tell you from experience that you don't want that, so I'm crossing my fingers for you on that front. Thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. You can also find me on social media, on either Twitter or Instagram, via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. Cheers.